right, Margaret, are you in charge tonight? We're both here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got six o'clock straight up, so let's begin. Good evening to all. We'll be excusing Maddie tonight, who's unable to join us. And we'll also be excusing Sherry Kelly, who will join us about seven tonight. She's um, detained until then. So welcome. Here we are. Please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the community for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Madam Secretaries, I have, we have two in charge. Please call the attendance for tonight's meeting. Director Kelly is absent for now, and Director Levesque. Here. Director Ray. Here. Director Rawson. Here. President Fay, Here. And Superintendent Sweeting. Here. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? I motion we approve the agenda. And a, a second. second. Thank you. It's been motioned to approve the agenda with a second. Madam Secretary. Director Levesque. Aye. Director Ray. Aye. Director Rawson. Aye. President Fay. Aye. Um, next on our agenda is approval of the minutes. Um, the first one, item A, is the special Zoom meeting study session minutes from May 20th, 2021. May I have a motion to approve that, please? I can make a motion that we approve the May 20th, 2021 meeting minutes. I'll second that. Thank you. The motion's been made and seconded to approve the special Zoom meeting study session minutes from May 20th, 2021. Madam Secretary, please. Director Levac. Aye. Director Ray. Aye. Director Rawson. Aye. President Fay. Aye. And second on the agenda under, under approval of minutes is to approve regular Zoom meeting minutes from May 24th, 2021. We'll need a motion. I can move that we approve the regular Zoom meeting minutes May 24th, 2021. Thank you. I second it. Thank you. It's been motioned and seconded to approve the um, regular Zoom meeting minutes from May 24th, 2021. Madam Secretaries. Director Levac. Aye. Director Ray. Aye. Director Rawson. Aye. President Fay. Aye. Thank you so much. Now we can go on to presentations and recognitions. And we're going to begin with an exciting announcement from our um, superintendent, Dr. Chris Sweeting. We will be introducing our new student advisors. Good evening. I am very pleased to um, introduce to you uh, several individuals that we are proud to have join us in leadership roles for the district. So first, I would like to introduce Kyle Schroeder, who is a sophomore at Arlington High School. He just turned on his, his camera so you can see him there. Um, Kyle is joining the board. So he'll be the student advisor on the board for two years. And he hopes to gain leadership experience and an understanding of the inner workings of the district. That will happen, Kyle, very much so. And Kyle holds, holds a 3.679 GPA. He um, enjoys participating in the Arlington High School Knowledge Bowl on their team and, and in Ultimate Frisbee. He is taking advantage of college and the high school opportunities right now, and he hopes to graduate not only with his high school degree, uh, but also with his AA at the same time. Um, he does plan to go on to a four-year college and pursue a degree in electrical engineering or law. So Kyle, welcome to the board. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, as you know, my name is Kyle Schroeder. Um, I'll be the new advisor to the board. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I was born in Arlington. I've been here my whole life, and something that goes along with that has been the schools. Uh, I've been going to these uh, Arlington Public Schools uh, for as long as I can remember. And so being able to have this advisory position and being able to be in a leadership position, um, it's a great opportunity. And I think that um, having been in part of this community for forever uh, really strengthens just 
it, it's an amazing opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks, Kyle. We're excited to have you join us. So welcome. And so we have an, two other students that are going to join um, our Advisory Council for Education or our ACE Committee, and they too will serve two year terms. The first one I'd like to introduce is Madison Griffin, Griffith, and she is a sophomore and she believes that her membership on ACE will provide an opportunity to make a difference and to advocate on behalf of students. And we strongly believe that student voice is needed because what we're doing is all about serving the students and their learning needs. So she also um, hopes to gain experience that will help her following graduation. She has maintained a 4.0 GPA and she'll be participating in Running Start this fall. She's been involved in recreational soccer as well as JV soccer and track at Arlington High School. She considers herself to be well-rounded and motivated. And she also, just like Kyle, anticipates of graduating from high school with an AA degree in chemistry, along with uh, planning to go on to university in pursuit of a degree in forensic science. So Madison, welcome to our team. Are you here tonight? And would like to say a few words. I am, thank you. Uh, I'm very determined. I'm excited to start. And as Kyle mentioned, I've also been around here for a very long time. So I'm excited to see some input into what happens in the future. Thanks, Madison. Looking forward to your voice and your thoughts. All right, next we have Morgan Heavily. And Morgan is a, she is also a sophomore and excited to on the idea of really connecting with the Advisory Council of Education and believes that um, the quality experience to, uh, for students is important to have student voice. She also maintains a 4.0 GPA and is the president's, uh, president of the Writers Club at Arlington High School. She is also involved in the Arlington High School Drama Club and outside of school, um, all kinds of different activities, kung fu, tap dancing, cello, and jazz dancing. And maybe she can tell us there's, I think, several more as well. So also involved in the Running Start program, she expects to graduate from high school with an AA degree as well, and eventually go on to achieve a doctorate in physics and become an astrophysics. Astrophysics, that's amazing. So are you here with us, Morgan? Yes, I am, thank you. So as you all, you all know, my name is Morgan Havely. I'm a current student at HS. And I was recently accepted into the ORCA program. I am very excited to have this opportunity to connect with both the Arlington Council for Education and the student body to not only better the education of the students at Arlington High, but to better the education of the entire school district. So thank you for that. Thank you. Glad you're with us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Welcome, Madison, Morgan, and Kyle. And after this long year, my message to you is enjoy the summer. And Kyle, we'll see you at the end of August um, at our first board meeting. And Madison and Morgan, I'll see you at the first ACE committee meeting in September. So I'll look forward to working with all three of you. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. All right, next we're going to um, move on to honoring our 2020-21 retirees. And I'm going to turn that over to um, Eric DeYoung. Yes, good evening, uh, board members. Um, nice to be here with you. Um, sorry, I'm driving home. I just pulled off the side of the road though. So uh, we are excited to recognize our 2021 retiree, retiring class, our graduating class, I guess, from Arlington School District, if you will. Uh, they've been with us for uh, many number of years. There's a, a good list of, of employees this year. Uh, and due to COVID, we have not been able to recognize our last two uh, staff graduating classes with an in-person uh, celebration. So we've been doing it via Zoom on, at our board meetings. And Gary Sable, again, this year has put together a nice little recognition for our employees. And so Gary's going to pull that up uh, for us and start that off. Our our retirees, I believe, are in the audience tonight, and we want to thank them for their many years of service uh, to, the, to the district, to our students, 
uh, our families, community has just been great service that all of them have uh, given to our district. So I want to thank them personally. And they also received a, an Apple award from, from the district. Those were delivered out to their buildings uh, this year for them to uh, hopefully place somewhere um, at their home to remind them of their service in Arlington. So let Gary go ahead and hit play on that thing, Gary. So President Fay, as you can see, we have uh, quite a list of retirees this year, that, lots of big shoes to fill uh, around the district. And so we're working on that, on filling uh, those spots right now, but uh, we wanna honor them and thank them for, for all their years of service, including our own Julie Davis is on there. Um, and so th those are gonna be some really big shoes to fill, that's for sure. Well, Eric, I have worked side by side with many of these dedicated professionals and Indeed, they will be missed. I want to thank all of you for, for those of you that are here with us tonight for your many years of dedication to children. You've fed them, you've nurtured them, you've counseled them, you've loved them, so many of them as they learned with your guidance and you watched them grow. And now with retirement, you will be in charge of your time to spend in your pursuits of choice. And I wish all of you that next adventure in your life be fulfilling and rewarding as I know it has been with your years of service to our students. Thank you.
I wanted music with that, Gary. I was really hoping for a little music. <laughs> it, it, it actually has music, Judy. For some reason, it didn't it didn't come across. But what will happen is tomorrow, I'll post it on our YouTube channel, and I'll share, I'll share it via social media. So you'll hear the music then. I don't know why it didn't show up. But yes, it has music on it. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah, All but, right. Thank you, Gary. And thank you yes. so much for putting that to Gary, together also, Gary. Of course. Of course. You are amazing. So moving on. Um, we are going to now move into um, item five on our agenda, comments from the audience. Madam Secretaries, do we have anyone who would like to address the board tonight? We do, we have one signed up. All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and read the script for audience comments. The board recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of involving members of the public at our meetings and has therefore set aside a time of regular meetings to hear audience comments. You may speak about an agenda item or a non-agenda topic. This is the only time during the meeting where public comment will be taken. Please listen carefully to these instructions. If you wish to speak to the board during this comment time, please click the raise hand button on the bottom bar in the Zoom window now and leave it raised until called. If you are joined by telephone, press star nine to raise your hand. We will first call on those who pre-registered to speak. After that, we will call on any other raised hands. Each speaker will be given one opportunity to speak. When your name is called, you'll be temporarily unmuted by the clerk. Please clearly state your name, spelling the last name and email address unless you have already provided your contact information to the clerk and keep your comments as brief as possible, three minutes or less. The president may interrupt or terminate an individual statement if it is uncivil or, or exceeds the allotted time. The board does not respond to questions during the business meeting. The board's silence does not signal agreement or endorsement of the speaker's remarks. If you are requesting a response or just prefer to provide comments to the board in writing, please do so through the district website at asd.webnet.edu. Choose administration, school board, contact the board. All right, we're ready to begin with um, comments from the audience. Okay, we have uh, Principal Dwayne Fish from Arlington High School would like to speak about the SRO agreement. So, um, just, just allowed to talk. There you go. Okay, Dwayne, you should be able to speak. Yeah, go ahead and put out to panelists. Dwayne, we had to move you over to panelists, so you should be able to speak now. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. All right, um, I saw on the agenda um, that we are talking about the interlocal agreement and new business item F um, with uh, the city of Arlington Police Department about the SRO position. And while I know uh, the board has voted in the past in support of the program, um, I, I just wanted to make sure uh, that as the uh, leader of the largest campus um, in Arlington Public Schools, um, that I uh, once again uh, spoke about the benefits of having an SRO and why it's critical to the health and safety of every student on our campus, our visitors, our staff, all of it. Okay, so um, we've, we've, I, I've spoken about this before and others have too, and it's well documented how the SRO is used in Arlington Public Schools and how it's different than other uh, places in America where SRO programs may not have been as successful as they are here. Um, uh, so I won't go into details about that. What I want to want to share with you is I want you to, before you, you vote on this and make your decision, think about what has changed since October 22nd of 2019. Has our chances of being in another incident of violence on our campus gone up or down? And I'm going to help you answer that. In 2019 or in 2021, since January of 2021, so far this year, in America, 272 mass shootings. That's four or more people shot, injured, 
or killed. Um, that's up from 194 in the same time frame in 2020 alone. That's an increase of 78 mass shootings in the United States, or 40% increase over 2020. Since 2019, that increase is up 108. There was only 164 in 2019. It's becoming an increasingly more volatile and violent country um, as a result of many, many things happening, right? That's a 66% increase. And our campuses are no different. They're a microcosm of society. So in emergency, seconds matter. Um, we don't, if you're talking about minutes, we don't have them. And I know I have 30 seconds. I'm going to go a tiny bit over. Um, we don't have minutes. We have seconds. Um, not having a dedicated SRO means we run the risk of officers being tied up on other emergencies and not available and having to come from further away or being on a call somewhere far away from our campus and having to respond. Um, response times are going up across the country, not going down. Um, the bombing incident in October 22nd, 2019 would have been dramatically different had SRO also not been at the door within seconds. And I've talked about that before. I don't want you to forget that, uh, especially given the statistics that I just rolled out to you. You can look those up. They're easy, easy to find. 66% increase in violence, uh, violent mass shootings. So the potential for chaos and increased confusion would have been there. So I want, to, I want you to ask yourself this before you decide on what you're going to vote. Um, have these, is the potential increased or decreased since 2019 for us to have another incident on our campus sometime? Are they going up or are they going down? Please, I implore you, vote to approve the SRO program because it's what's best for the safety and security of every Eagle. And it's every student in our district. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Fish, for coming tonight and sharing, sharing with us. Julie, do we have anybody else that has a hand raised to speak? We do not. All right, then with that, um, We'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, are there any questions or comments from the board about items on the consent agenda? If not, then um, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll move that I we approve. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead Mary. No, it's fine, you start it. Okay, I move that we approve the consent agenda. I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded to accept the consent agenda. Um, Madam Secretary, please call for approval. Director Levesque. Aye. Director Ray. Aye. Director Rawson. Aye. President Fay. Aye. Thank you. And now we'll move on to item seven, new business. And we'll begin with the report of donations approved by our superintendent um, for this month of May. Uh, in the month of May for of 2021. Dr. Sweet. Yes, I'm pleased to um, report tonight that during May, I approved a donation of $1,000 from Dorian Photography to Eagle Creek Elementary, and the funds will be used for student teacher supplies and special projects. Another example of generosity in our, in our community. Thank you. Judy, you're muted, sorry. All right, we'll pick that up again. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sweeting. Next on the agenda is grant approval. I think the, Ellison, the Ellison grant for Haller Middle School and that goes to Trevor Summers. Good evening, everybody. Um, Rachel Harrington, one of our phenomenal science teachers has uh, applied and been approved for a grant. And this grant would allow us to create an outdoor learning space for our students. I've talked with Brian Lewis and Ed Aylesworth and already picked a, a location for the site. 
we've mapped it out. Rachel's put all the um, purchasing details together. And so everything's ready to roll. It's gonna have um, a fence area. It's gonna have 30 seats for students. It's gonna have a nice big whiteboard. It's gonna be um, nice and secure back kind of uh, across from kids closet. And it's just gonna give us another, another space to learn. And I think with uh, you know, the recent mass breaks and some of the different things that we've used this year as far as getting students outside and moving around, this space is going to be used a lot. So um, it's, it's gonna be awesome. And, and I definitely hope it gets approved and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have on the grant. No questions, Trevor. It just sounds uh, exciting. Uh, it's going to be a cool, cool thing to see. I had one question, Trevor. Yeah, sure. Um, is it going to have a cover over it? Um, yes. Yeah. Part of the part of the grant that, that Rachel put together has a like a gazebo that'll that'll be covered and a, a nice cement pad that I've worked with Brian and Ed on, so it'll be fully covered, and we'll have uh, good storage out there for. Um, each student's going to get each class that goes out there. There'll be 30 kind of mini whiteboards and then one bigger whiteboard for the teacher to instruct on. But yes, it will be covered. Thank you. That's all my questions. It's exciting. Awesome. It is exciting. I'm thrilled. I want to come. I want to come and hang out there. I'm so glad that this is happening for us. And it'll be a great example for others to, to model off of. Excellent. So with that exciting news, do I have a motion to approve the Ellison Grant for Haller Middle School? I'll move that we approve the Ellison Grant for Haller Middle School. Second. I'll second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to approve the Ellison Grant for Haller Middle School. Madam Secretary, let's approve this. <laughs> Director Lebeck? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Rawson? Aye. President Fay? Aye. Yeah, it'll be fun to watch this come together. Next on the agenda is um, item C, Academics and Student Wellbeing which was formerly called the RAS Committee, and we will hear updates and planning for the 21-22 school year from Dr. Chris Sweeting. Mute. I'm, good evening. I'm going to start the slideshow. So tonight, I, we're going to give just a few updates. Um, one of those that we usually provide is the Snohomish Department of Health update. And really, at the last meeting, which was last week, the focus, Dr. Spitters was not at the meeting. So the uh, members of the Department of Health team were there, and they shared information about vaccination clinics across the county. And uh, Brian Lewis will share more information about what's nearby that will take place soon in this next month. They also also changed the meeting schedule. So we'll be meeting with Dr. Spitters and his team now during the summer once a month. So the next meeting will be July 6th and then the following meeting will be August 3rd. And at that time, we'll determine if we're gonna go back to every other week meeting time. Also pleased to report, this is the latest on the um, count. So we are going down and down. We have, it looks great. So we're down to 79, that was posted today. So good news there on the infection rate. It is going in the right direction. Um, the, the Arlington Public Schools health metrics, these are the same as they were last week. We aren't, uh, summer school started today, so we'll probably start that up, but probably not, it won't be um, as, we won't be sharing this as often because we don't have a lot of students on campus right now, but we will be doing close contacting. And Brian will share some of the changes and protocols that are gonna take, take place during summer school. So wrapping up 2021 and moving forward into summer, right now I am asking uh, Brian Lewis, Executive Director of Operation to, to share with us, what are those changes and protocols starting now, moving forward. Good evening, directors. Uh, on May 13th, next slide, please. Uh, on May 13th, 2021, uh, Washington State Department of Health issued revised guidelines for uh, response to COVID-19 protocols effective for our summer 2021 session and the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, some of these uh, have been in place uh, since uh, uh, the 
the pandemic began last March, and uh, and there are some that are uh, missing, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, what stays and what goes. Uh, number one, exclude self or student from work if, if there are any symptoms of COVID or, or when close contact uh, has occurred with someone who's uh, diagnosed positive with COVID or the other range of issues uh, that would exclude someone from uh, work or school, including uh, uh, symptomatic and waiting for the results of a COVID test or when told to isolate or quarantine uh, by a medical professional. Uh, universal facial coverings, that has not changed. Uh, they're required uh, across campus. There is uh, one exception to uh, universal face coverings that is new, uh, and that is uh, when you're outside. Uh, if you can stay six feet away from uh, another person, maintain that physical distance, uh, then you can remove your face covering while you're at school. Uh, we're still required to provide uh, PPE for all students and staff. Next slide, please. Some of the physical distancing uh, requirements have changed. For example, in an instructional situation, uh, it's been reduced to three feet uh, between students and students. That does not apply from between students and staff. Uh, staff still have, have to maintain six feet of distance from students and from other staff members or adults uh, inside of the school building. Uh, in uh, a situation where uh, students must maintain that six feet of distances when there's a potential for increased exhalation. Uh, our primary uh, instructional uh, programs that would this would affect would include uh, physical education, uh, band, and orchestra. Uh, and then uh, the change that uh, we've been employing throughout the school year uh, and we're mandated to continue to include uh, six feet of distance during meal time. Uh, report, uh, case reporting uh, is, is continuing uh, for positives and close contacts. Next slide, please. Uh, this is not a requirement of the, uh, of the new guidance, but we're continuing this. We've had this in place uh, since uh, last year, and that's sign it. Uh, we're using a program that we've uh, got in place called State Visitor uh, to record the presence of uh, itinerant staff or visitors uh, to school buildings. Uh, itinerant staff are people who are not uh, generally assigned to the building 100%. That could be our maintenance crew, it could be our technology staff, it could be specialists that are moving from uh, building to building. Uh, for example, speech therapy, uh, physical therapy, those kinds of specialized services. We don't have safe visitor at our district office, sports services or transportation. We're gonna keep recording uh, presence of uh, staff not assigned to the location or visitors uh, on a paper log. Uh, the isolation of symptomatic persons during the school or workday, that's going to continue. We've got a, a strong uh, process called the care room process. Uh, and in fact, uh, we provided training on all of these uh, changes and, 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 current, and guidelines that will continue uh, to our summer school administrators uh, last week with the expectation that they would pass them on uh, to staff working inside of the building. And we've got a reporting process set up in a, in a way to contact uh, medical uh, or medical staff if we need to during the school day. Uh, ventilation, that's nothing new. We're going to continue uh, to maximize outside air into the building uh, and move outside for instructional purposes when we can. Uh, cleaning and disinfecting, uh, the, change, the biggest change here is uh, moving away from disinfecting uh, when students uh, or to, to a time when students are not present. Or let me let me rephrase that moving disinfecting to a time when students are not present. Uh, we can continue to use soap and water, uh, which we've established at the elementary level. Uh, and we are gonna continue to use uh, disinfecting wipes at the secondary level for classrooms. Uh, and those, uh, those uh, disinfecting wipes are food grade, so they're safe to handle by anybody without PPE. Next slide, please. Uh, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, this is nothing new as well. We're going to continue to provide opportunities for students to wash their hands or use hand sanitizer uh, anytime they change an activity or upon entering a building uh, or after uh, they cough or, or sneeze uh, and they need to cover their cough or sneeze. And then current practices, well, when I say current practices, uh, there were practices that were in effect until June 14th today because we are entering our summer session. Uh, daily health attestations. Uh, if you've got, uh, if you're uh, have a, uh, an employee 
school employee or a student in your household, uh, you should not be receiving uh, health, attestation, health attestations from Qualtrics any longer, the electronic survey. Uh, and then uh, we're suspending temperature checks upon entry to school buildings. We're leaving the uh, no touch temp check devices uh, in the buildings for use by staff uh, and as necessary. Uh, we're gonna leave them up in the school health rooms and in the staff room so staff can check the temperature upon entry if they desire or the, the nurse can use the temp check device if they need to. Okay, moving on to vaccinations. Um, we've established uh, a business relationship with Walgreens. When I say business relationship, there's no money exchanging hands. Uh, we are providing a location for Walgreens to provide uh, vaccinations for uh, children age 12 and up, uh, any community member and, and families of children uh, that are getting vaccinated as well. Uh, we're providing these uh, opportunities uh, on June 19th and June 26th for first dose administration of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, the locations will be at Arlington High School uh, on June 16th and, and excuse me, June 19th and 26th. Uh, from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., and then at Haller Middle School on those days from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we distributed uh, communication to families this morning uh, with a link to the Walgreens scheduling uh, website where families uh, can complete uh, an appointment request and a, uh, a verification uh, of that this person is uh, able to provide consent to the vaccination for, for their child if the child is receiving a vaccination. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks, Brian. I'm I'm just going to finish up and then we'll have uh, questions I think after the slide. So planning for next school year, we did receive approval of our academic and student well-being plan on Friday by OSPI. So that's the one that the board approved in May on the 24th has now been approved. And, and then we are planning uh, throughout the summer, taking care of logistics for step six, which is five days of in-person instruction available to all students who so choose to receive it. And so with that, I'll move on to any questions or discussion that the board may have. Brian, thank you so, so much. So I just had. Oh, Mark, go ahead. So I have just a quick question. So um, in order to do the uh, six feet during lunches, um, I think we talked about that additional staffing might be needed, at least from a, a supervisory perspective. Um, how are we doing on the logistics associated with getting enough staff so that we can uh, have still have our six feet separation, but have the kids all kind of spread out over the over the different school locations, having lunch uh, once we're back with a full count uh, uh, every day. Yeah, definitely, Mark. That's we have added that to the list of uh, additional staffing that we could use ESSER funds for. You know, for that we just have to identify exactly how many. So each elementary school is. We're looking at half of the students eating in the classrooms and the other half in the common area in the lunchroom area, and that's going to require additional supervision. So each school will identify and they actually have sent that amount and we have that and cabinet actually meets on Thursday to uh, finalize those asks and those needs. Secondary, we're still working out what this really looks like. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, more students. So we haven't yet reached all of the logistics or finalized those, but whatever the staffing needs are, we will provide and, and we haven't posted them yet, but we will be posting um, for what I would call an army of paraeducators to support this, the needs. Excellent. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Brian, I just wanted to say thank you for organizing the vaccination availability to students on campus. Um, much appreciated. Are there questions? Um, Great stuff. I got a couple. I got thoughts. 
so yeah, uh, thanks, Brian. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sweeting. Good stuff there. Um, good to see that we're uh, progressing on. So as the students are going back to in-person five-day week instruction, uh, I would like to talk about us going back to in the boardroom meetings in September. So, I mean, short version, I'd like to see us. Discussion. I'd like to see us start in-person um, uh, board meetings starting in September. Um, of course, we've already talked about, um, at least I think we have, I'd like to continue the Zoom platform as well. I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. I'm sure it'll be slightly different. Um, you know, it'd be good for remote attendance in case uh, somebody isn't in the area, but it's also to allow for more participants like we've had um, so many during this time. So I know there's some technological things to work out and I'll leave that to Dr. Sweeting and her team. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd sure like to see us uh, return to in-person meetings in September. And I guess I'm not really sure that we um, um, will require, what action we would require to do that, but just see what other people think about that. Um, Mike, I would, I would fully support doing that. Um, the PUD is moving to a hybrid uh, where I work. Um, the one logistic thing is they did have to mount a camera in the back of the room so that the actual full boardroom could be um, could be viewed as well. Um, uh, so that the people who are dialed in or just watching the meeting could essentially see the meeting uh, from a camera mounted in the back of the room. It wasn't a large expense, but uh, that was how they're working out their uh, combination of hybrid board uh, and uh, public meeting. And I will say that we have um, we have purchased some equipment already in anticipation of this happening in the near future. So we, uh, Gary Sable, went and observed at an Everett School Board meeting, and they have a, a piece of equipment called the Owl. And so now we have our own Owl in the boardroom, just waiting for us to return at some point. Well, I was, I was studying about that same thing today and I read up on the requirements and we would still be required to wear masks, but yet we would be like on screens. And I thought that would be a little bit trickier, but I would love to be back in person, especially since we're all vaccinated. It would be so much easier to have conversation. Mike, thanks for bringing it up. It would be nice. To, it was so good to see everybody at the high school graduation. It just, I mean, I was filled with joy um, to see all of you and it, it gladdened my heart and I would love to get back. Um, I'm wondering about uh, talking through a mask, how we'll be able to hear each other um, on through the Zoom audience. I don't know about that, but I was at a swim meet last week and the coach was on the sidelines and she was masked, she had to be masked, but she was mic'd and, and encouraged the team through her mask, through a mic. So that's just an idea. I thought, well, you know, if we can't hear each other, that would be fairly easy to mic us. Um, so yes, I'm, I would love to see you all back in September. Yeah, there are each of you at your station um, in the boardroom, you have mics, individual mics that you can, you know, use for sure. So that's already set up. The one thing we have to pay attention to is the capacity. So we, if there's a constraint on the capacity, like say 50%, that means that we have to uh, provide space for whoever and how many people would want to come in person. So that might mean we would, might even need to move the board meetings to a different location, or we would have to set up some satellite um, locations like at the district office. So we'd have to work through that logistic, but you know, things- could We should be so lucky. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thinking positive about that. For but, sure. you know, <laughs> those are, and, and also the, that could change between now and September as well. You know, the, the um, I don't know, the capacity requirement, it could change. Certainly. So, I mean, Dr. Sweeting, it sounds like um, all the board members here are in favor of returning. Um, you know, you need some clarification in the form of a, uh, a, a mobile that, but if not, um, um, you know, whatever your comfort level is, but um, 
uh, I'd like to, you know, affirm as of today that we are um, planning on returning to in-person board meetings starting the first board meeting in September. Um, and I'm happy to um, start any process that you feel you need to um, ensure that that's going to happen in two months. What's yeah. your thoughts? Well, it's interesting. So we went to Zoom without a board vote, you know, so it seems strange right. that we need a board vote. It might just solidify it and take any questions out of it for the board to someone to make a motion say we're going to be back you know if things are the way they are right now and we want to be back in person and um in september it just might take away some questions about that but i don't think it's required but you could do it just to confirm sure well with that note um Go i'd ahead, like to make a move it sure i'd like to uh, move that uh, uh, barring any um, legal difficulties um, that we return to in-person board meetings in September of 2021, whatever the first board meeting date I'll is, insert. That. All right, it's been moved and seconded to return to um, in-person board meetings, the first board meeting in September. And, um, this would then be a time for comments. Are there any comments that any board member would like to present? Um, Mike, you made the motion. Is there anything you would like to say first? Uh, I have nothing more to say. Okay, anything, to. Any, any other board member that would like to speak? It would be awesome. It would be almost like normal. <laughs> All right then, um, the motion has been, um, uh, move, uh, made and seconded to bring um, board meetings back on campus um, with the first board meeting in September. Madam Secretary, could we call for a vote? Director Levesque? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Rawson? Aye. President Fay? Aye. All right, with that, we'll move on to item E under new business, which is the advisory council. Oh, sorry, sorry, excuse me. We're on item, sorry, we're on item D. Item D, I'm gonna back us up, which is Arlington Public Schools Equity Plan for Social, Racial and Educational Justice. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, School Board President Fay and School Board Directors. This is Will Nelson, the Director of Equity and Student Success for a few more weeks. Uh, I want to thank, there's a couple people in the audience that are on the district and community equity team. So uh, Victoria Dowdy, who spent countless hours with me editing and compiling all of the edits. So Victoria, thank you. And then Tanya Banyak and Erica Knapp are both in the audience as well. And Erica is going to introduce our students who are going to present tonight. So Erica, all you. Thanks, Will. Um, I get the honor of introducing our students who are gonna to present tonight. They are all right juniors, highly involved in various sports and clubs, including the city team and they're extremely valuable. They are Janice Clemens, Lena Abelman, and McKay Olison. So we'll start with Janice. Good evening. Um, my name is Janice Clemens and I will be um, introducing this plan. So in the school year of 2019 and 2020, the Advisory Council for Education drew up an equity plan uh, for the district that was the first step in the process of making this school district more equitable and a more uh, acceptable community. Then the district community equity team or the DCET spent the past school year looking over the equity draft and deciding what things needed to be changed, added and elaborated on in the draft. This document has been finally come through by high school students, parents, teachers, and administrators in the district who are all key stakeholders in the community. The goal of this plan is to align district practices with the district's mission, bring people from the less represented groups in the district into the conversations we have about equity and other district-wide practices, prevent negative unintended consequences, and to address how the district is doing with everything that I've stated today, and make sure that we do our part when it comes to making Arlington School District an equitable community and a place where all people feel safe, 
welcomed, included, and supported in everything that they do. Um, Elena? This is a very important plan to try and get past. Most of this is involved with the students at Arlington High School and every school that there is. The students' voices can get heard only so much by what they give. But with this plan, we're able to extend more to the students than basing it off of what all of the adults and staff hear from themselves. Each school has a different level of communication with their students and some lack, other, lack more than others. At the Arlington High School, I could tell that we've been very trying on trying to get more students' voices to be heard by including different clubs and putting up different pictures and opportunities for students to be heard, which this plan can help them ensure that it will actually happen. McKay Jay. As my fellow classmate and team members, Janice Clemens and Elena Abelman summed up our listed eagles and overall impact, as well as the importance of why this plan and goal should be implemented within our school district, we have now given you the specifics, the impacts, and the importance of this equity plan. I now urge you, members of the school board, to consider and approve our equity plan for social, racial, and educational justice. Thank you. And thank you to you students and to Erica. Do we have anybody else that would like to speak to um, the social, racial, and educational justice equity plan? Do we have any questions from the board? Well, then I, <laughs> I have something to say. Um, thank you to all of you that are here tonight that have worked on this plan. This has been an amazing job. Um, I, I know this plan well. Um, I've read it numerous times. I've helped um, scrutinize and, and edit it. It is detailed, it is comprehensive, and it's an ex it has excellent resources listed in the appendix for easy access. Um, and I clicked onto those links um, a couple days ago and sure enough, right there was um, the social justice standards right there available for me, ready to see, ready to use. So I also appreciate that. I have one little request. Um, could we also include a link to um, the Since Time Immemorial curriculum? And that way that would be right there also um, to access. Um, it's such a gift to have all the resources all in one place. And then my only other question is, um, when will this document be available for students, staff, and parents? So uh, Judy, thank you. And thank you for the suggestion about the SDI curriculum. I will definitely put that link in. Uh, as soon as you adopt it, we will start getting the word out to everyone. All right, thank you. And thank you, um, um, Elena and Mikete and Janice and Erica and Victoria. I hope you all are, well, I'm having a terrible e echo, but I'm gonna try and continue. I hope that I will see you all continuing on the equity committee next year because your voice has made such a powerful statement and we have the document now because of all of you, thanks. So now we need a motion to approve um, Arlington Public Schools Equity Plan for Social, Racial, and Educational Justice. I motion that we approve the Arlington Equity Plan. I'll second that. Thank you. It's been motioned and seconded to approve Arlington Public Schools Equity Plan for Social, Racial, and Educational Justice. And Madam Secretary, could we have a vote on that, please? Director Levac? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Rawson? Aye. President Kay? Aye. Thanks again. All right, we'll move on to um, item E, 
which is the Advisory Council for Education, the ACE Committee, um, and it is their annual report. And this will begin with Dr. Sweeting. Good evening again. I'm going to start the slide presentation. So we have um, the Advisory Council for Education, the ACE Committee has been a longstanding committee that in, is comprised of students and parents and staff members across the district. And so uh, part of our charter, and uh, Gary Sable is going to uh, give a few highlights of it, but part of our charter is that each year we give you an annual report. So this is our annual report update. And with me uh, that will be speaking tonight will be Erica Coghill. She is our 2021 chair. And then we also will have Brittany Kleinman, who is next year's chair, the 21-22. And actually, actually, Erica is going to stay as the assistant chair. So they're, they're going to be a powerful partnership for our ACE committee. Uh, will Nelson, Director of Equity and Student Success, will also be involved in this presentation, as well as Gary Sable, Director of Communications. So first, I'd say that the ACE committee um, is the work of the committee is really aligned with the strategic plan. The intention of that is that everything that we do in the committee, the work that we do is to support um, one, if not all of the goals in our strategic plan, student learning and achievement, safe and caring environment, resource stewardship, and partnership and commu community and parent partnerships. So it is aligned with that. And with that, I'm gonna ask Gary Sable to talk about the scope of the ACE work. Thank you, Dr. Sweeting. So the, the uh, really the purpose of ACE is to um, provide systemic representative public involvement in educational decisions under consideration by the board of directors. And, and really what that means is um, they can be charged with different things throughout the year. For instance, um, a couple of years ago, the district uh, looked at our existing strategic plan and the ACE committee was really involved in, in looking at that and, and um, looking at what was important and improving upon it. And so that they had a really big impact on that. Other things could be you know, researching a topic about which the board would like more information. Um, for instance, like the early release, you know, late start type of thing. That's something that the ACE has been looking at. Um, and then they would provide a recommendation. Another example of that would be the, the equity plan, as was mentioned by the students tonight. Um, that's nothing, it started with ACE and there was a subcommittee and then it kind of expanded from there. So um, also uh, another work response that could be received general information from the district and school staff. ACE has provided different reports throughout the year uh, to keep them up to date on what's happening with the district. They also serve as key communicators to community members um, informing them of district uh, initiatives. Um, they also populate other subcommittees, for instance, like, like the equity committee that I mentioned, um, they do that as well. And they also provide informational presentations such as this annual report. So uh, that's kind of in a nutshell what the, what the uh, ACE committee does. Next slide, please. So the ACE committee is comprised of a number of different people because we, we really want a lot of uh, representation, not only from, from you know, parents uh, and staff, but also students and community members. So um, we have uh, 14 different uh, parents, citizens who are on, we have two certificated staff members, two classified staff members, uh, two principals, one elementary, one secondary, um, one or two in the past, some higher ed representation. Uh, one or two either city representatives or representatives from the business or other industry, and then a um, typically a high school, a senior or junior, but th th that fluctuates. Um, right now we have, uh, well, it, it kind of varies. Right now we have four students. Allie is, is leaving us here, unfortunately. <laughs> She's been a great voice for the students, but we have three other uh, juniors who will be seniors next year who do a great Job and give some great insight, and of course, as you meant, as you heard tonight, two other great students will be joining us. So it's just really nice to have all that um, student voice, you know, join the voices of the parents, uh, uh, citizens, and the staff. So that's it. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Gary. So Erica Coghill, our current chair, is going to share our the topics that we um, uh, learned about this year. 
Hi, good evening. So, so just like our students and teachers and, and the board meetings, uh, we switched our ACE uh, group uh, to online as well and it didn't stop us from covering a number of topics this past year. Um, of course, the top of the list and the top of all of our concerns was reopening of Arlington schools. Um, we covered the equity uh, conversations and equity plan. Um, every meeting we had district updates. Um, again, a lot of stuff that was going on with COVID and the plans and getting um, students back into in-person learning, um, discussing um, SRO, student enrollment, transportation, um, discipline updates and policy review that happens every year, as well as the sexual harassment policy review and report. Um, reviewing budget and school funding and how that works, um, student nutrition, adjusted school schedules, um, late start, early dismissal. That was kind of shelved this year because, well, <laughs> everything else it seemed like happened. So that'll be interesting um, moving forward into the next year. Um, if we revisit that again, just with this um, online learning and, and doing things at different times, um, it'll be interesting to see how um, that kind of meshes into what we explore. Um, into the future with that, um, then later uh, school start times for secondary. Thanks, Erica, yeah. very much. So then Brittany Kleinman is going to tell us about uh, the accomplishments for this year and then what uh, are potential research uh, topics for next year. Good evening, board. Um, this year, we were really involved in um, the ongoing review of our reopening school efforts. Uh, many of our members were uh, participated in the RAS committee um, over last summer and early fall and hoping to make decisions and discuss what options we had for opening schools for last school year. Uh, we reviewed and contributed to the final draft of that equity plan that you just approved, um, and we engaged in some thoughtful equity conversations um, and activities led by Will Nelson, which was um, really eye-opening for a lot of us this year. Uh, we also worked really hard to um, engage student voice. Um, some of us were involved in helping pick some of the student representatives that you met earlier tonight um, for both ACE and the school board for our next year. Next slide, please. Um, next year, our potential uh, research and focus areas are um, continuing our equity, equity conversations. Um, one thing that's been discussed is doing a book study next year. Um, we plan to continue working on the reopening schools to be in fully open schools and those discussions um, and efforts in the academic and student well-being plan. Uh, we also are going to continue working on our inclusionary practices and then continue talking about those adjusted um, schedules for students um, to try to increase student learning. That would include uh, making changes to early release um, or late start or changing um, start times for secondary schools. Thank you, Brittany, very much. And the next slide, um, I'd like to invite Will because we're gonna honor um, one of our students that's been with us for two years and she's graduated and moving on. So Will. Thank you, Dr. Sweeting. So gracias, Dr. Sweeting y directores de la Junta Escolar por dar este tiempo y espacio para honrar a Ali. Thank you, Dr. Sweeting and school board directors for giving this time and space to honor Ali Amescua Toscano. Ali has servido en el Consejo Asesor para la Educación durante los últimos dos años, durante los cuales su, vo uh, su voz ha eliminado nuestro trabajo y nos ha alentado a pensar críticamente sobre nuestro objetivo que utilizamos para mejorar el logro académico y el bienestar de los estudiantes. Ali has served on the Advisory Council for Education for the past two years, during which her voice has enlightened our work and encouraged us to think critically about our lens we use to improve student achievement and student well-being. Durante este tiempo, Ali también sirvió en un pequeño subgrupo con un enfoque en la equidad. El resultado El, el resultado de este subgrupo fue una política de equidad adoptada por la Junta para nuestro distrito. Esta política de equidad ha llevado al desarrollo de un plan de equidad quinquenal que les vamos a presentar esta noche para adoptar. 
During this time, Ali has also served on a small working group with a focus on equity. The outcome of this working group was a board adopted equity policy for our district. This equity policy has led to the development of a five-year equity plan that, we're, that we are bringing to you this evening for adoption. Ali también ha sido miembro del Consejo de Diversidad y Equidad de la Escuela Secundaria de Arlington, elevando la voz de los estudiantes cuyas voces históricamente han sido oprimidas, celebrando así la riqueza del, de la diversidad en nuestras escuelas. Ali has also served on the Diversity and Equity Council at Arlington High School, uplifting the voices of of those whose voices have historically been oppressed, thereby celebrating the richness of diversity in our schools. Ali es tranquila y al mismo tiempo tiene un voz fuerte que conduce a un cambio poderoso hacia una sociedad más justa, social, racial y educacion educacional, y por eso todos nos inspira. Ali is calm and at the same time is a strong voice that leads to powerful change towards a more racial or a more social, racial, and ed educational just society. And for that, we are all inspired. Ali, no podemos esperar a ver el impacto que tú tendrás en la sociedad. Tú naciste para digerir y sabiendo que liderarás nuestra próxima generación, nos da espacio para respirar. Ali, we can't wait to see the amazing impact you have on society. You were born to lead, and knowing you will be leading our next generation gives us all room to breathe. Y um, yo, nosotros, estamos felices de conocerte y estamos tan orgullosos de ti. Esperamos que vuelvas a vernos algún día. Muchas gracias. I, we, are so happy to know you and are so very proud of you. We hope you make it back to see us one day. Thank you, Will. Ali, would you like to say a few words? Hi, thank you so much. Your Spanish is really good. Um, and it's been an honor and a privilege to be able to work with all the intelligent minds on the ACE committee. And I will definitely be looking back on this experience. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Ali. We're just so, um, we have grown so much from your, from you and your voice. Thank you for helping us to grow and become better people. Thank you. And congratulations on your um, graduation. So with that, um, I think Erica is going to um, take any questions that the board may have at this time. I have a question. Um, is the ACE committee planning a meeting in person again next year? Have they discussed it? Is it an option? And could they add one more thing to their topics to address next year? I think that with the mental health in the, the crisis that it's in with our students, that maybe that could be something that could be discussed um, a little bit more in depth next year. Okay. That's a good point. I, I missed the last meeting, unfortunately, but I would imagine we would follow the um, recommendations. And if the board's going back, I don't see why there would be a reason why we couldn't do that with adhering to whatever we needed to do to make that happen. Yeah, we might um, do the, well, we'll see what we can do for the first one. We could either meet on Zoom for the first one and then decide, you know, as a group, we just didn't really talk about it at the last meeting, so. Yeah. And there's been some advantages to Zoom too. I think we've had a higher participation because um, people are, you know, they're having to get childcare or deal with dinner and stuff because we do meet at 6 p.m. So, um, you know, there is some advantage to Zoom. Maybe we'll do a hybrid. Yeah, so I think, yeah, we'll discuss that more. Good thoughts, Mary, thanks. Any other questions? I don't have a question, but I wanna thank both Brittany and Erica for your leadership. Um, you've led well. And um, thank you for, for just being there for as many years as you, as you both have given your time and your energy and your service. Um, and I also want to thank um, you for helping to guide our children because you do and you look carefully at the issues and the concerns and, and I am so thankful. And I also want to thank Allie. It was a joy to work with you and um, all the best to you. And I wish I could jump out and give you a hug because I would just love to do that. But but the next time I see you, I I indeed will. So you've been warned. <laughs> I'm gonna 
hug you. <laughs> well, thank you for your kind words. Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right. Um, next um, on our new business agenda is item F, interlocal agreement with the City of Arlington for School Resource Officer Services. And we're going to begin with Brian Lewis. Thank you, Dr. Fay. Uh, tonight joining me is uh, Dan Cohn, Assistant Police Chief for Arlington Police Department. Dan, could you introduce yourself, please? Good evening, board members. Uh, again, like Brian said, um, that Dan Cohn, the Deputy Chief of Police for the City of Arlington, and um, appreciate you guys uh, reviewing this and look forward to your vote. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Dan's going to be a resource in, in case we have any questions uh, regarding the ILA or APD. Uh, so tonight we're going to look at the supporting board policy uh, regarding uh, the SRO program, uh, the history of the SRO program in our schools, uh, some excerpts from some surveys. This is new for us in the terms of the proposed agreement. I want to uh, remind you regarding a, a slide that I presented at the May 17th board workshop regarding the safety and security ecosystem. Uh, and you can see uh, that the intent here is to communicate a, a, an articulation across all these different fields and, and how they all contribute to a, a safe and secure school climate. First responders, which includes SROs, uh, is listed as one of these components along with physical security and technology, a collaborative safety and security culture, student threat assessment, risk mitigation, and emergency management. Uh, the, the board policies that support uh, uh, the, our interaction uh, with APD in terms of the school resource officer are listed here. Uh, 3225, which is the school-based uh, threat assessment, uh, and it includes a reference to the presence of the school resource officer on the threat assessment team. Uh, 4310, district relationship with law enforcement and other government agencies, and 4311, the school resource officer. This was a policy that was uh, re revised by the board in 2019 in response to legislative changes. And basically the language that's included in policy 4311 is reflected in the, uh, the interlocal agreement with the proposed, both the current one and the proposed agreement with the city of Arlington. Uh, real briefly, the uh, SRO program uh, our involvement with uh, police in our schools began uh, in 1990 with a, a DARE program at the fifth grade level uh, that uh, served as a launch pad for uh, APD uh, as, uh, in our schools at Arlington High School uh, as an SRO in 1999, expanded to two SROs in 2003, uh, one at Arlington High School and one at Post Middle School. Uh, this was prior to uh, Howard Middle School existing. Uh, in 2006, uh, APD chose to reduce uh, our, our uh, SRO presence to one, uh, and this person was assigned across the district. Uh, in 2013, due to budget uh, realities, uh, APD uh, attempted to cancel the program or wished to cancel the program. Uh, the school district responded by uh, funding uh, the SRO, the existing SRO in place at 50% and increase that funding uh, to 100% in 2014 where it remains today. Uh, so we've had uh, the school resource officer uh, in our buildings uh, since 1999. So the next section we're going to talk about uh, the family and community survey and the student survey. Uh, we uh, included some questions on the survey uh, this year uh, specific to, uh, this has been an ongoing survey uh, for at least the past four years. Uh, we did add some questions to it relative to safety and perceptions around the school resource officer. So I'm going to show you a couple of questions. Uh, the full survey has not been released yet. Uh, the superintendent Sweeting did allow me to pull a couple of responses off of it uh, for the purposes of this presentation. 
Uh, first questions are from the Family and Community Survey. Uh, always good to see uh, a response like this. 88%, 88.7% of respondents uh, felt that the, uh, the, their child was safe. Uh, their child feels safe while they're on the school ground. It's really encouraging to see that. Uh, again, these questions are new. Uh, we intend to continue these questions in the future. Uh, these questions serve as a, a baseline for us to uh, gain some insight into the, the thoughts of the family and communities. And uh, they're really useful to have these questions if they continue into the future uh, to help us gauge uh, our responses in terms of uh, improving performance uh, relative to these questions. So uh, the question about school resource officer, again, it's new. Uh, the, a lot of folks uh, did not respond to this question uh, because uh, the, they didn't know uh, if the school resource officer was respected and liked by students. And I appreciate the honesty uh, that they had uh, while replying. So uh, out of the number of respondents that did reply uh, with either strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree, 94% uh, of the respondents responded uh, as agree or strongly disagree that uh, the school resource officer was liked and respected by students. And then the final question uh, that we've excerpted here uh, is having a, a school resource officer on campus makes me feel my child's school environment is uh, very safe, safe, unsafe, very unsafe, or don't know. Uh, the percentage of unsafe responses uh, to this question, or excuse me, don't know responses to this question was, was much smaller. Uh, than the perception that uh, uh, how does the student view, how does their student view the SRO. In this situation, 95.3% uh, of those that did not respond, uh, don't know, uh, felt that the, the uh, SRO's presence uh, created a very safe or safe environment uh, on campus. Uh, I also provided you uh, about three pages of comments. and. I want you to know that you know these comments were not uh, selected for any kind of uh, bias or or, 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 perceive, or present any kind of um, uh, skew one way or the other. These are all the comments uh, that were provided on the family and community survey uh, relative to the SRO, and this is just a sampling uh, that they've got on the screen right now. Uh, and the, the, the comments were generally reflective of uh, the uh, support for the SRO program on campus. Moving to the student survey, uh, the student survey uh, excerpts, uh, you'll recall that the, um, the family survey felt that 88.7% um, of their students were safe on campus. Uh, student survey uh, is generally in alignment with that. 85% uh, feel uh, that they agree or strongly agree that they are safe on campus questions relative to the SRO. Um, in, in the interest of you know, transparency, uh, the student questions where students replied either disagree or strongly disagree, uh, we provided accompanying demographic detail uh, for those questions that were that was attached to the board agenda. So on the uh, student survey questions that mirror the, the family and community survey questions, the school resource officer is respected and liked by students. Uh, again, we had 46% that didn't know. Uh, of those that did respond with they did not know, 85% uh, either strongly agreed or agreed. Uh, how does having an SRO on campus make you feel? Again, we had uh, a number of students that provide or that responded did not know. Uh, and in this situation, 85% again felt that they were very safe or safe. Now, I, I want you to understand that uh, we're concerned with disagree or strongly disagree or, or uh, unsafe or very unsafe uh, responses to these questions as well. We want to understand uh, what it is that's driving these students to, to believe this or feel this way. Uh, and the same goes for these other two questions. Uh, my interactions with the uh, Arlington Fleet, the SRO, uh, the vast majority of students replied no interaction uh, with the school resource officer. Uh, the percentage that did apply, or excuse me, did reply was something other than no interaction. 90% were very positive or positive. Uh, and uh, comfortable, how comfortable are you reporting problems uh, to the SRO? 
Uh, again, 42%, nearly 42% replied they don't know because they, they had not had this kind of interaction. Uh, and 73% felt very comfortable or comfortable uh, in reporting problems to the school SRO. Uh, there was one comment, one narrative comment attached to the survey. Um, at this point, this is our only window into uh, why a student would respond uh, in, a, in a not positive way. Uh, we want to uh, seek understanding uh, and, and we would want to, uh, to to find out why it is that students would not be comfortable reporting problems to the uh, school resource officer. This has a direct uh, impact on school safety. Uh, as Principal Fish stated uh, earlier, we are seeing a rise uh, in uh, criminal actions occurring in the outside world. Uh, whatever is occurring in the outside world generally is reflected uh, in the school community uh, as well. Uh, and we, we want to make sure that you know, we've got every tool available to us uh, to respond to a criminal uh, behavior or acts of violence on campus uh, moving forward into the future. And to do that, we'd want to uh, understand why it is students would feel uh, negatively about the presence of the SRO on campus. So moving on to terms of the proposed agreement, um, this is a, an exact duplicate of the agreement from last year. Uh, it complies with uh, district policies in the RCW. Uh, the duration uh, is September 1st, 2021 through June 30, 2021 uh, or 2022 or whatever the last day of school is uh, that has been determined on the school calendar. Want to refresh your memories uh, in regard to uh, attestations that the police department is making uh, when they enter into this agreement with us, uh, that the SRO is trained on constitutional and civil rights of children in schools, uh, child and adolescent development, trauma-informed approaches to working with youth, recognizing and responding to youth mental issues, educational rights of students with disabilities, uh, collateral consequences of arrest, referral for prosecution and court involvement, uh, resources available in the community that serve as alternatives to arrest and prosecution, local and national disparities in the use of force and arrest of children, uh, de-escalation techniques when working with youth or groups of youth, uh, restraint and isolation laws uh, of the state of Washington, bias-free policing and control, cultural competency, uh, and FERPA, protecting the uh, educational rights and privacy of students. Uh, the Arlington Police Department has to certify that the SRO has received training uh, on these areas. Uh, and they also, uh, the agreement clearly states that the SRO does not serve uh, as a disciplinarian uh, within the operations of our schools on a daily basis. That is the sole purview of uh, Arlington Public Schools uh, administrative staff. At this point, I will pause and uh, see if there's any questions that the board may have regarding this proposed renewal. Brian, I had a quick question. We had talked about um, the uh, full-time resource being available to do education or have some visibility at other schools. Uh, it says 180 days on campus. I assume that's just the AHS campus, but isn't the SRO also available to uh, do, you know, other kinds of educational programs and things at the elementary and middle school level as well? That is correct. Uh, and they generally do uh, participate in outreach activities at other schools uh, besides the Arlington High School. And the, the, the agreement does not limit uh, or even state uh, that their uh, primary responsibility is Arlington High School. It's really more of the the overwhelming uh, burden of activity that an SRO would be uh, involved in occurs at Arlington High School as well as the largest single building of students. It's like the size of a small city uh, with 1,800 or 1,600 students plus another 250 staff on hand, excuse me, 200 staff on hand. So it's just like the, the large animal in the, I don't mean to put it in that phrase, in that terms, but 
It is the it demands totally understand. The I just want to make sure that the, the agreement doesn't say it's in your PowerPoint. You say campus, and I just want to make sure that the mm -hmm. the agreement isn't specific to just the AHS campus for the SRO. They can participate in other activities across the board at both middle schools and elementary schools. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. That was my only question. And Brian, I had a, a question about. Um, I know they've done the like the drug. I call it the drug program, but you know, anti-drug program. Um, and I wonder that sounded like something that was outside of this particular contract. Is that correct? Where they do the training? Um, they had, I know they came up to the high school and they did those couple of days and they mm -hmm. worked with the kids. I don't believe the Dare program is uh, an active program any longer. Dan, do you do you know about that? Dare is an, uh, an active program, but we've been doing a lot of um, outside drug presentations. Um, the SRO is always involved in those, and um, it, it's just such a big program. We usually have other staff that help, um, but the, the SRO really does a lot of our early narcotics and in, uh, instruction in the elementary schools. Um, our previous SRO, Stephanie Ambrose, developed a lot of good programs that we still use today. Um, well, we did before COVID. Um, so a lot of that stuff was really put on pause. Um, we also do reading buddy programs. We do lunch buddy programs where yeah. the chief and I and other officers go up and have lunch at all of the different campuses. So we're, we're definitely spread ac across the board. Okay. Yeah, and I think, um, Sherry, um, the program aid act through the city you know the advisory council where the students involvement they actually worked with all first responders like police and fire to come in and and provide um training there's been some great opportunities for that I have another question. I don't know if this is under Brian's purview. Um, so my question would be, if, if we did not have an officer and would that same money be applicable to mental health counselors at the high school? Like, could you substitute those two things? This, it's a line, it's just for this. Counselor would have to be funded some 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 other way. Well, Sherry, I, I don't think that it's um, accurate to say that these are a, it's a zero sum game. It's either a choice between uh, the SRO or additional mental health counseling. Uh, okay. While we've had uh, the SRO program in place, we have added mental health services across the district in the past few years. Right. I, I don't. I, I, I don't think that that means we would stop adding those mental health services as a response to the, an, an increased need. Yeah, and I definitely agree. We are not going to, um, you know, having the SR pro, SRO program or that approved contract will not keep us from getting the, the support or resources we need. And I can see Gina said nodding too, because we have a list of needs that we're working on right now, you know, that relate to social, emotional, mental health. Right. I, I think from what I read from some responses, and they weren't, they weren't probably the dominant response, but I definitely want to hear that voice. And I also want to articulate to the audience that's listening that um, that we're definitely addressing that. It sounds to me like what you're saying is these are kind of two different things and that, gosh, if we pulled money from the SRO program, we could put it over here and get more counselors. So that's not really the case. And that's what I wanted to understand. Um, I wanted to hear that from you and that that's explained. Um, and yes, I would like, I mean, eager to hear what Gina says in terms of, um, I know there's more federal funding and I have been an advocate for more mental health counselors myself for years. So that's the, that's the camp I'm in. So thank you. President Fay, I'd like to move that we accept the interlocal agreement with the city of Arlington for school resource officer. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Mike. Is there a second on that? 
it's been, thank you, Mark. It's been moved and seconded to approve the renewal of the school resource officer interlocal agreement with the city of Arlington. And um, Madam Secretary, could we call, uh, before we, um, um, uh, um, before we discuss the mo um <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. And um, at this point, we have an opportunity to discuss the motion that has been made. So um, the way that will happen is the motion maker, who is Mike, will speak first and last, and then each board member will have an opportunity to speak to the motion once, and then a second opportunity to speak again after each person has spoken once. And then we will call for a vote. So um, this is our opportunity if we would like to speak to this. Um, and I'm gonna call on um, our motion maker, Mike first. Would uh, you like to speak to this topic? Sure. Thanks, President Faye. Yeah, uh, I see, uh, speak in support of this motion to support uh, the school resource officer. They do a uh, fantastic service um, with our schools. And, and quite frankly, I couldn't imagine uh, not having one uh, available to our campuses on a uh, you know regular basis as their full-time position. Uh, I think it would be pretty taxing um, for not only the schools, uh, but for the uh, local police department as well. So I'm happy to support this. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Mary, would you like to speak to this? I do have some concerns with this, um, with the responses that I read. Um, in the, the survey responses, I, I, uh, it was not what I was expecting. I didn't realize that it was, um, I really appreciate the students speaking up. I was encouraged that they felt comfortable enough to address this issue and share their perspective. I have never known that so many young ladies in our schools felt uncomfortable reporting things to the SRO. I was unaware that there were some concerns there. I did not realize how many young ladies uh, did not feel safe having an officer on campus. It was kind of eye-opening for me and concerning. Um, I thought, what if we had a school resource officer that was a female? Could that be an option? I know we had Officer Ambrose um, a few years ago is that something that could be um, tried out? And I'm, I'm just, I'm not comfortable with the survey responses creating more discomfort for our kids that are female, for our kids that are of uh, color or of, of concerning, uh, like they don't feel comfortable with the police officer. And I can tell from personal experience that right after the uh, horrible um, September 11th attack um, and the airplanes and the tragedies. Um, we flew home for Christmas that year and it was scary to get on an airplane. But you know what made me more scared was walking past rows of National Guard men, men with very long, big weapons. And I did not feel safe. I, I didn't trust them. I didn't trust any military at that point because I felt like there was a lot of conflict um, and people, I just didn't trust them. And I felt really nervous and really uncomfortable holding a kid in each arm and a baby uh, across my lap. So I don't think that the impact that these kids feel it should be disregarded and ignored. And I don't think that anyone has the intention of harming kids um, in, in regards to this school resource officer. I know our resource officer is an in, incredible, um, highly intelligent, well-trained, strong, determined, wonderful man of integrity. And I think he's great, but maybe the kids don't see that. Maybe the kids don't feel that. So I, I don't think that it's in the best interest of 100% of our kids to bring the school resource officer back on campus. So that's my opinion. Thank you, Mary. Um, next, Sherry, do you have any other comments that you would like to make this first round of comments? I, I do. Um, 
I guess one thing that I, I was I was similar to Mary in that, and just it was kind of surprising to me to see that um, students, uh, more so female students, uh, felt some level of discomfort uh, with the school resource officer. I think part of me is I would really implore the district to uh, to go uh, ferret that out a little bit more. I wanted to also know if this was the first year, I think Brian said something, this may have been the first year those questions were asked in the community survey. Is that correct, Brian? Yes? That is correct, Sherry. Okay, okay, so here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking we have a snapshot right now. And when you're talking that size of a school with 16 plus, 1600 plus students, and we're getting not a great, what I would say, a great sample rate, whether it be community or students, I wanna see more. I wanna see more responses to give me surety of comfort or discomfort and why, why is there a discomfort? Um, I also agree kind of what Judy was saying uh, or Mary said about um, maybe we'll look at a, a female officer. I know we have a couple on staff, that's possible. Um, I also know when I was there a couple of years, kids, I call them the bouncer, but there were some of the guys that would kind of help out with the parking, uh, tall guy, great. There were two. There were two different guys. I think one filled in the shoes, the other one. I kind of like that. I felt like this person was very casual, kind of knew the kids. I could see how an officer could be intimidating, on both sides. Protection, like, hey, if something goes down, there's somebody that is going to help me, or maybe this person has a presence, and I don't feel comfortable that they're on my on my site. I, I get both sides of it. So, um, I am very much in the middle on this i i think that if someone if some of our students are not feeling safe then we have to address that we need to we need to go deeper and find out why i'm not in their heads i'm not 17. i'm a grown woman and i've i've walked city streets so i've seen that i i i'm tough these kids aren't you know um it's different for them it's different they have a different background than i have so i want to appreciate that but i think we it's paramount maybe we re-examine this do another survey three, four months into school next year and see where we're at. I would like to see that number improve, but I think we need to go a little deeper and find out why. Um, anyway, that's part of where I'm saying, I, I think in my head, I, I have one opinion about SRO, but then I'm thinking, you know what? I don't know that this is a, a truly a fair assessment. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's more kids that feel this way that we're not getting the information. I don't know. So I just, I feel like I need more information to say that, but um, yeah, I think that's my only only concern is that if people are uncomfortable, I want to know why. And then what can we do to ramp up if we if we are going with this contract? I want to know what that looks like in the fall, because I know there's a ton of good they do. I know the book by these. I get that. Um, but maybe we look at softening, having a, you know, a personality that, you know, uh, that's really amenable. I, I'm not saying that people haven't been, but I've met a couple folks and I've, I've been happy with both SROs that I've been in contact with. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Sherry, thank you for sharing. And I'm the last board member um, on this first round of- I haven't uh, had a chance to talk, Judy. Oh, I am so sorry, Mark, I, I, you are next on the list, yes. Thank you. So um, I, I want to uh, speak in, in favor of this. Um, we talked about this last year, but maybe uh, for those of us that weren't here about how important um, mental health counseling is to all of our students, especially coming back next year. Um, I think the SRO provides a key uh, mental health resource for kids who feel like they want to reach out to someone. And, and while some students are, um, obviously based off the survey, uncomfortable with the SRO um, as, a, as that resource. I think many of our students are very comfortable um, talking to law enforcement and reaching out and, and having that, that authoritative, uh, confident figure to talk to about issues and things. So um, I think uh, uh, that having more mental health on campus is really important. And not everybody's going to avail themselves of the SRO as that person to ask questions of or to confide in or to talk about, et cetera. But it is a resource. And from my perspective, the more we need more mental health um, uh, leaders on campus in all roles. All right. And whether that be um, you know, the SRO or whether it be our counselors or whether it be our administration or whether it be that teacher, I think everybody's going to have to put on their mental health counseling hat first 
and you know put students first as far as that social emotional piece coming back on campus next year and i want to have as i want to have as many hands on deck for as many venues as we can avail themselves and i think the sro fills that role for many of our students so i'm not looking for a silver bullet that says the sro has got to do it all um, but i think it's an important avenue for many of our students and i want to see it on campus um, my only suggestion is uh, again, I think a lot of people said they don't know, and that's why I'd like to see the SRO have a little bit more visibility into some of our other campuses. Um, uh, so whether that be, you know, uh, presentations or whatever, like what is my job and what do I do uh, on campus, but it is a full time resource for the district to take advantage of. And so I think there's probably time in the schedules for um, that to happen throughout. Um, but like I said, I, I, I see the SRO as that uh, um, a confidant that many of our students can use and to confide in and that can uh, help as we go back um, with uh, a lot of what I think will be uh, strong social emotional issues that we're going to have as we head back full time. That's it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for sharing. Um, and so as um, the fifth board member, um, I would like to say that um, thank you, Mark, for reminding us that yes, this is our, our second time visiting um, the SRO discussion. And last year we strongly encouraged um, the use of a survey so that we had some, some documentation, so that we had some answers. So we had some um, input from our students. And throughout um, our board meetings, throughout everything we do, equity, um, ACE committee, um, the two words that come up constantly is listening to our student voices. Um, and we finally provided a platform um, for the first time for those student voices to be heard about their feelings for SR uh, and SRO on campus. 19 of our female students told us that they feel unsafe or very unsafe with an SRO on campus. Um, we have to listen to those 19, 19 female students. It is our responsibility to listen to them. It is our job to provide a safe and caring environment for all of our kids. We need to do a better job. So um, I'm gonna do a, a quote from the, sur from the surveys from um, one of our parent um, responders. And um, it, this is what this parent said. If any students feel unsafe with a resource officer, maybe because of their culture, I don't think it is worth having. We may disagree that people should not be afraid of the police, but the reality is that many people, people of color and people in poverty do. And um, I'm going to add to that, um, that not only people of color and people in poverty, but females too. So um, that's our first, I'm going to stop there. And that's our first round of discussion, uh, discussing with everybody's input. And I'm going to ask for a second round um, if people would like to voice a second opinion. And I'm going to begin this time with Mark, who we um, was at the tail end and I, he thought I forgot, but I didn't. Mark, is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, nothing else, nothing else, Judy, other than I, I echo Sherry's uh, concern that out of, you know, 1600 out of 1600 people, which I assume is about 800 females, there are 16, I agree, but 16 out of out of 800 is not a majority. Um, uh, and so I just wanna make sure that if we're, if we're looking at those 16 responses as somehow indicative of the majority, they are not. Um, and so we just need to make sure that we, we don't have enough sample size to uh, make any decisions based off the survey data. I'm not saying we discount it, I, I just echoing Sherry's concern uh, that the data that we have doesn't support um, a n long an n long and uh, large enough to come to a conclusion based off the survey data thank you mark um and from there i'll move on to sherry do you have any other comments sherry no, no? i don't thank you you bet and mary do you have anything else you would like to add i i wanted to address mark's point there was 289 responses to the student survey. I don't know how many of those were in each grades, 
but 8% of them said that they did not feel comfortable. So 8% of our students don't feel comfortable. And then 10% no, felt you, no, the, the, no, 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 that's of the, of the people that filled out the survey. There. Excuse, excuse, excuse me, Mark. excuse me, wait, excuse me, excuse me, Mark, Mark, excuse me. You need to let Mary finish. You need to let Mary finish. So please let her continue. Just do the math right. That's no, 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 no. You can have you can have your turn in just a moment. Okay, Mary, could you please finish? Um, yes, from my math, um, there was 289 responses to those questions. We had some answers that felt that they were uncomfortable reporting to the SRO. Um, there was quite a few comments also made. There was a good chunk of children that did not feel comfortable reporting their concerns, which is the whole point of having an SRO is to report concerns to, and people didn't feel comfortable. Uh, a lot, the ma large majority of the comments were from females. And I feel like as a woman, as a talked over woman multiple times, I am a lot of the time ignored and I do not want to ignore these women. And I will not let these voices go unheard. They represent a large section of our children. And we need to serve 100% of the students in our district, not just 90%. Thank you. And Mark, um, before, before I can have you um, um, speak to, well, actually I can't um, by parliamentary procedure because we have to um, allow every person on the board to make, to have a second voice. So um, my, it is my turn next. And um, um, what I would like to say um, is I don't care if it's only 9%. I don't care if it's only 19 um, out of 289. Those voices um, are um, the most important voices to me right now in the room. And their needs and concerns um, have to be taken into consideration. Otherwise, if we continue to say um, um, we support student voices, um, it's not a real reality. And that is, is our goal, is to hear our student voices. Um, there are other solutions to provide a safe and caring environment for all of our kids. And I would love to see a task force that would, could be gathered to explore options, such as um, um, adding additional mental health counselors through Stilly Connections, discussion of female SRO as an option, adding another security guard rather than SRO. I mean, we can, we can absolutely discuss this. We have not. We have not had an opportunity at all. Um, we just got the results. But I'm going to um, quote another comment from the survey. Um, and this was from another parent. I'm going to read it. It says, I strongly consider I would strongly consider reallocating the money for the SRO program to truly support all students. It takes resources, it takes, excuse me, it takes resources and money for equity work. Think about spending that money on monthly required professional equity training for all staff, including administrators and the school board. Another idea, spend the SRO program money on funding student equity clubs at all middle and high schools. Money could be used for after school, transportation needs and food activity costs. Be creative, be brave. So, um, our next person um, to address the board and our final person is Mike, um, who was the person that made this motion originally. And so Mike, I'm going to ask you if you would like to speak again to the motion that you made. Yeah, President Thay, thank you very much. Um, I have a lot of thoughts and comments. <sighs> Let me gather myself here for, for a second. So first of all, I mean, I care about each and every one of our students, our staff, and and everybody here in the in the in the uh, community. You know, we have, and I'm going to use some round numbers. We have 5,400 students, right? We had a, a very small sample size of students who responded. You know, um, some of you have pointed out the uh, minority number of students that have um, uh, voiced a shall we say, a non-supportive view of the SRO in some way, shape, or form. Um, 
and I've heard a couple of different numbers thrown out, but let's just say it's 20, right? And let's say the number is 300. What about the 280 people who support the SRO, right? They feel comfortable talking to the school resource officer. They like having the school resource officer on campus. I mean, those are the voices that um, none of you have spoken about. Um, you know, it is about, uh, you know, we're in a democratic society. We're all about supporting uh, uh, folks as well. Now, I, you know, I don't, um, I would love to live in a world where we could have 100% support of everything we do. We're not going to. Um, I don't know what percentage um, for me is, is, a, is a percentage that we wouldn't do something, but certainly not a few students and a small, less than 10% of even those who um, would, would prevent me from supporting a program that is supported by the majority of those who did respond. Um, yes, we need to work on mental health counseling. Yes, we, I would love to uh, have a little bit of an understanding, um, if possible, of, of why uh, folks aren't comfortable talking with the SRO program. But, you know, quite frankly, um, not everybody is going to be comfortable talking to the school resource officer for whatever reason it may be, right? They're not, maybe somebody's not comfortable talking with Mr. Fish. That doesn't mean we should remove Mr. Fish and get somebody else, right? I mean, we, we can certainly look to provide somebody that they are comfortable to speak with. Um, and, and work towards that. And they're just quite frankly, students that aren't gonna be comfortable talking to a law enforcement officer ever, right? And that's just, um, that it is unfortunate. I feel sorry for them. Um, and, and I wish they, they did feel comfortable because, you know, uh, Officer Cohn uh, and, and Officer Olson and all the other officers um, that we deal with, I mean, they're just great people. Um, and they do good work and they support our community and they put their lives at risk every day to make us safe. Um, you know, and uh, this is not gonna come out right and I will apologize in the beginning, but um, while I do care about everybody's feelings and I hope that people do feel safe, uh, we're also talking about young adults who are not fully mature and, and don't, aren't uh, adults and aren't allowed to make uh, decisions for themselves, right? So we're talking about 14, 15, 16 year old kids, um, students and younger and older, right? There are definitely some, some 18 year olds there. And what I would say is that because of that, I mean, we're here to make decisions for them, right? Some of those decisions are, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry you don't feel safe, but the reality is I want you to be safe our job, I feel my job um, as part of this board is to ensure that we provide a safe caring environment. And part of that is to have a school resource officer present. I, I, I'm sorry if you don't feel safe, but the reality is you are safe. And that's what we, we look at. So um, I, do want to, uh, I do want a response. The, the only thing I could come up with here quite uh, on my uh, computer, and I just don't have all of the um, comments. So um, I'm going to re uh, read some of the comments I see from the family and community survey. That's what I was able to pull up quickly. Um, those comments are keep the SRO. I'm just reading down the list here. Um, one says police in school isn't the answer. They need to work together to make uh, home life safe and supportive to prevent the problem behavior before it gets to school. I would certainly agree. But unfortunately, um, that is not what we are working on. We work about things that are in school. Um, Children attend elementary school and don't have the benefit of an SRO on campus. Well, that's um, not 100% true. Certainly they don't spend the, most of their time at the elementary school, but they do go there. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to pick some of the shorter ones because I know we're going long here. Uh, I would love to see the addition of a resource officer at the middle school, so would I. Um, one resource officer for the entire school district is not enough to keep our schools as safe uh, or to be the turret the program could be. And it goes on and on. There's a lot of support here, right? I mean, certainly uh, there's more support from the survey than there isn't support. So I would encourage and urge all of our school board members to support this um, 
interlocal agreement for the school resource officer. I mean, it is our responsibility as a school board to provide a safe environment. And part of that is to have a school resource officer on campus. Thank you, President Fay. Thank you, Mike. I've been asked um, to adhere to parliamentary procedure. And so I, um, because of that, though, I would like to hear um, again from, from other people, from Mark Rawson, um, and I would certainly like to speak again. I will not, and I will not call on Mark because per par parliamentary procedure, we are allowed to speak twice. So with that, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the renewal of the school resource officer interlocal agreement with the city of Arlington. And it is now time for a vote. Madam Secretary, could you call for a vote, please? Director Levesque? Nay. Director Ray? Aye. Director Rawson? Aye. President Fay? Nay. And Director Kelly? Aye. And so with that vote, um, it has been motioned and approved that we will renew the school resource officers interlocal agreement with the city of Arlington. Okay, moving on in our agenda. Madam Secretary. Oh, Madam yeah. President, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Can I make a motion that we have the ACE committee look into the survey results for the SRO? and form a task force to respond to this concern. Is there a second? I support that. I. The motion has been made and seconded to establish um, um, a task force to explore other options and um, take a look at the survey. Mary, I kind of botched that. Um, Can I um, ask a question? I'd like to ask a question. Are you asking for a task force other than the ACE committee or are you asking the ACE committee to be that task force? I would like there to be a separate task force. It could possibly be part of the ACE committee. I don't know how it would be formed, but I think there should be a separate group to just talk about this topic. Okay. Mary, oh, just a quick question, oh, no. Judy. Mary, would you look, since we're the, coming to the end of the school year, would this be something you'd wanna pick up at the beginning of the next school year in September? Or are you talking right. about doing some yeah. more? Okay. September, yeah. Okay. I just wanna dive deeper into it. I, Thank you, thank you. So a motion has been made and seconded to form a task force to explore other options and to explore the results of the survey to help define um, our students' responses to feeling safe and secure on our school campuses. Um, Madam Secretary. Oh, wait, 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 wait. With that, um, it is now time, we have time for a discussion on that. Um, and before we call for a vote, so I'll call on each of you in order if you would like to comment. And I'll begin with the motion maker. Mary, would you, um, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Nope, I just think it's worthy of a deeper discussion. Okay, and I'm gonna move from Mary to Sherry. Would you like to add anything else? No. Okay, thank you. And from Sherry, I'll move to Mark. Mark, would you like to add anything to that? Nope. And Mike? Sure, um, you know, Mary, I, I'm I'm totally supportive uh, of a, of the thought of a deeper discussion and some more discussion on the topic. I I think that uh, moving um, to do that at this time is is not the correct time. What I would like to see us to do is to table this this motion um, and really just kind of as a board, we can ask Dr. Sweeting to um, uh, and have some discussion to. Uh, come back to us with what she recommends is the best course of action for a deeper dive into the subject. Um, uh, so we don't just uh, get off on a, on a tangent and we're not emotional about what we're doing. Let's just, uh, I'm fully supportive of, of, of deeper dive. Uh, I'd like to do it the right way. 
Uh, I'm not exactly sure your, your motion is, is it, 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 there's a lot of gray area in it and, and I'd like something a little bit more clearly defined um, in, in that, in that. So I, I would love to see us table this topic um, into our next board meeting where we can have um, um, some more information um, that can be brought forth that we have a, a better clear understanding of, of what exactly we're, we're, we're asking Dr. Sweeting to to do and and really what we're looking for you know as far as answers and, and what if anything that we're going to do with those answers right are we just I don't want to do a task force and have a bunch of comments and have a bunch of things that aren't going to do anything like like I, I'm all about let's let's get on board with with what's the right thing for our students and our staff and our school, right? And, and, I, and I, as you know, I, I truly believe that school resource officers there, but there's probably other resources that we're not providing that we need to look uh, for as well, right? And, uh, and, and how can we better do that? So I will not be supporting that motion. Thank you, Mike, for your comments. And I'm the last person on the school board to add comments. Um, thank you, Mary, for offering that suggest for that for that suggestion. I too would support a task force um, to look into this. Um, I have um, I'm not in the a position to make that happen, um, but I know that um, Dr. Sweeting and the cabinet and um, um, other people are in a position to um, define it, refine it, and decide how um, it will be, um, how, how it will happen. So um, I do support that and would be excited, excited to see that happen. Um, so with that, um, we have a chance to speak to that again. So um, I'm going to start all over again and um, Sherry, do you have any other comments you would like to make? I would like to add, I, I kind of hear what uh, Mike is saying, and I this is in light of fresh data. Um, my concern is that we have some negative responses. Those need to be addressed. Um, however, it is it, it's on the on the whole, it, it it's a, a small enough percentage. It, it needs to be looked at. Um, but I also understand what Mike's saying is that I think um, being measured in that it makes sense. Um, also knowing that we're going into the summer, um, I think that I think that we maybe take some time, maybe between this this time now, this board meeting and the next one, and think about what would that look like. What what what, what do we really need? And then, um, like I said, maybe we collect uh, you know, questions that would be very relevant to really honing in on why specifically students might or might not feel comfortable with this an SRO on campus. So I think that maybe before we create a full on task force, that maybe we, and understand that that, I understand the need, I understand exactly what you're saying, Mary, um, but maybe we take this time and kind of take a step back and assess that and, and be very um, focused on what that would look like. Um, I think that that would make sense to put this on our agenda for the next board meeting and then be more specific and um, intentional about um, yeah, what we want to do, how we want to proceed with that. And then if that is a task force that, that would be possibly members from ACE committee, um, that would be great. Um, if it's separate, that's fine. But let, maybe we just, I feel like I'm, there's a lot that we had discussion on tonight and I don't want to rush into something and just put something on there. Uh, but I definitely, I hear what you're saying, Mary. And I, I definitely think it, 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 it beckons further dis, you know, discussion and conversation. So I do support that. Thank you, Sherry. And um, next I'm gonna to move to Mark Ross. And Mark, do you have anything, a second comment you would like to make? Um, yes, I, I'm, I understand where Mike's coming from. And you know, if, if we need a task force on anything, it would be on social emotional uh, health of our students and our families as we head back. We have you know, a lot of things that require that level of effort. Um, I'm not sure whether a task force is the right thing for this. Um, I, I agree with, with Mike that we should basically, you know, let's come up with a plan. It needs to be addressed. Um, but I, I think there's, there's more important things for our district to be tackling right now at the task force level than uh, our, 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 our survey results from a portion of our students. 
Thank, thank you, Mark. And Mike, help me. Did I ask you for a second um, voice from you? No, I've, I've only got to speak one time. Then I'm going to ask for if you would like to speak a second time. Yeah, um, I, uh, I really don't have uh, the parliamentary procedure in front of me. Uh, but what I've done in the past is I just moved to uh, table this motion. And that's what I would like to do at this time is move to table this motion. Um, I don't have parliamentary procedure in front of me either, Mike, but as far as I understand, but Julie is here who is an expert. Um, as far as I understand, we a, a motion has been made and it has um, been seconded and it will then require a vote um, after two times of discussion. Julie, um, can you help us on this? <laughs> you guys are getting into territory I've not been in, but I believe that someone can move to amend that motion but not, not a completely different motion. Right, and, and, and so my understanding and what I'd like to do is to move that we table this. And so what I've participated for in the past is if I make them, if I move to table it, somebody seconds that, and then essentially it just is put to essentially old business for the next meeting. We don't vote on, the, on, on Mary's motion. Um, we just stop discussion on it. We, we move on and uh, next meeting, we take it up again. Um, um, I, I don't know what tooth, I don't know what that means, Mary, but you can go ahead and speak. Th that's my intention anyways. I would like to t discuss Mary's motion at the next meeting. From, from my understanding of what Brian explained to us about parliamentary procedure, it takes a two thirds majority, which is more than two out of three. So it would be four out of five in our group to stop a motion from proceeding. It's from my recollection. So um, I'm going to continue then with the motion that's been made. And um, because uh, we do not have a, parliamentar a parliamentarian in charge, we are all just doing the best we can here. So I'm going to proceed with the, with the uh, motion that has been made and seconded. And Mike, if you would like to then make a third motion, you are welcome to do so. So the motion has been made and seconded to, I'm going to paraphrase this the best I can, to, um, ex um, to establish a task force to explore other options to help our students feel safe and secure on our school campuses and also do a more in-depth look at the survey and the results of the survey. Um, so, Madam Secretary, could you please call for a vote? Director LeBeck? Aye. Director Ray? Nay. Director Kelly? Nay. Director Rawson? Nay. And President Fay? Aye. So with that vote, um, we will not be establishing um, a task force to look at um, establish, uh, to establish and explore other options to help all of our students to feel safe and secure on campus um, and to further study, um, take a look at the survey. Is there another motion that would like to be made? Okay, with that then, um, I guess I'm just going to turn to Dr. Sweeting and Dr. Sweeting, can we um, add that to our July agenda? Could we get a report from you um, after you've spent a bit of time um, looking at how we can proceed further to establish um, a safe and secure place for all of our children on campus and could, and a time and procedure for taking a more in-depth look at the surveys. My understanding from the original motion from Mary was that it was based on the survey results to take a look at a, a deeper dive into those survey results of why the students, you know, may have responded in that way. But what you just described was a bigger picture of keeping kids safe. That's that's a full meal deal. But what I thought Mary was talking about was this specific survey results to, and I am certainly uh, 
I can bring forth uh, next time um, and share a deeper dive into that. I know that the survey results that you saw tonight from the students, there was only the one comment. So all we have is that one comment from the students. So it's gonna be very hard to dig into the comments because there's only one comment. And there were uh, the family comments, we can dig into theirs and analyze their comments and we can, so just from my perspective, the digging deeper is really gonna come with additional dive in student survey, like what I, you know, talking with students next year, digging into that survey deeper. I mean, we because we really might not know why they said what they said on this particular survey, because I, I don't know. I mean, but I'm certainly willing to try, but students, it was anonymous. So students, you know, if it's anonymous, there's no way to really go back to them and say, why did you put what you put? But I think it's critical that we try to figure out why did that, why, did, why does any student feel unsafe? You know, and there could be a variety of reasons. It was already expressed. It could be, I just don't feel comfortable talking to anybody but my family about any of these kinds of things, or it could be anything. But I, I, I'm concerned that I won't be able to have that information at the next board meeting. I'm concerned that by between now and July 12th, I don't know where I would seek that, but I am committed um, going forward as we move into the next school year to continue to seek student feedback and try to dig deeper and somehow ask questions that they might respond with some, you know, some comments because they really didn't give us much. You know, so and ask. I do. Some board members did send me some ideas for some questions. So maybe we can get better at the type of questions that we ask. But I really, I'm not sure what I can gain from what we have right now. But I can certainly make a commitment to get um, deeper understanding going into next year. So, but Thank I'll, you. I'll do what you asked me to do. I will do that. I will try. Thank you, Dr. Sweeting. It's also been mentioned from um, more than one person tonight. Um, that perhaps part of the solution may be having a female SRO on campus. So um, um, I know that Dan Cohn, you're here with us tonight. And so, and you've heard these comments also. So that's also a comment that's been out there and um, definitely could be discussed. So um, President Faye, that, President if, Faye, if you don't mind, you know, it, and Faye, I, I'm pretty clear from discussion last year that that the Arlington Police Department, you know, selects their school resource officer, um, and we, you know, while we can certainly talk to them about it, I mean, they select it based upon whatever their personnel needs are and, and their policies and procedures. And and you guys, you know, have been great. And um, we talk about um, maybe having a female officer, the females more comfortable, but what about the male? So maybe they're not comfortable talking to female, right? I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's a back and forth issue. And, and I really would encourage you to not, um, I, I mean, you really seem like you're talking about one segment of the population and not the other. And that and that's discouraging to me. So um, I just thought I would, I would say that. Um, so thank you. Okay, um, that um, moves us then onward to um judy i i'm not yes. sure i i think dan Cohn may have a comment related to that i don't know if it's appropriate do you have your hand up dan yes i do i i just wanted to give a little historical information on our sro program uh, out of the six sros that i've worked with three of them have been female and the other three have been male um you had Officer Emma Davis as one of our first SROs. You had Lisa Teeter as another SRO, and you had Stephanie Ambrose as another SRO. Um, so, basing our our selection solely off of gender is um, a violation of a lot of different labor law um, issues. So, I, I can assure you that we can't base it off of gender alone. Um, but we do have a selection process, and we have input from the schools um, and at least 50% of the time we've selected females. So it is definitely something we are always open to. If we had more than one SRO, we'd be happy to have us uh, even split if we had the applicants. So, um, and anytime anybody doesn't feel comfortable speaking with the SRO, um, if we have a, a female officer on, we can always send them up. I mean, that's, that's 
been common police practice for the 21 years I've been in law enforcement, so. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for sharing. Thank you for, for joining in on that. Um, and I know there are, are many more comments on this, um, and I have many more, but we're going to move on. And so with that, we're going to move on to item G, which is the 2021-22 budget development briefing with our very own Gina Zutenhorst. Good evening. I'm Gina Zutenhorst, Executive Director of Financial Services, and I am here to share a 2021 or 2122 next year budget development update. And really today I just have two um, things to share with you. One is in regards to enrollment projection, which you're looking at now on the screen, and another is to share with you a revenue um, estimate for next year. So you are looking at the four-year enrollment estimate. The gray column is what has been approved by the board in the last February meeting. And then the, the yellow columns are, are um, coming forward, a conservative estimate for enrollment growth over the next three years. And this is using birth rates, um, cohorts, and a weighted average information from prior years. So there are many new and unknown effects of the COVID-19 environment, but with this, we are pr carefully projecting um, in the future years, a uh, moderate increase coming back, the enrollment coming back, because we did have an 8% decline this year. We have what going forward for next year, pretty flat as just what the, the board had approved in the February meeting, but going forward, we are still trying to uh, project that we have a moderate increase and you see that there. So this comes to you again in when um, we have the four year enrollment projection. And it also is the numbers that we use to project our four year future revenues. So coming to the next piece that I would share with you is the enrollment estimate. So I'm going to stop sharing or a new share or let's see if this does the job. Can you see an, an enrollment or a revenue projection now? Yes, great. So this is an estimate of next year's revenues. And you can see that it is um, compared to what we budgeted for revenues for this year, the year that we're in. And it shows you an increase decrease column and a percent change column. And then there are, are numbers on the far right that kind of explain. So if you're looking at this in detail, you can kind of, your eyes may be drawn to a certain big number or a certain big percentage change, where it's a, whether it's an increase or a decrease. And that little number on that right-hand side will uh, be explained in a legend that's down below that will explain more about what that decrease is and why it's why it is. So there's minor note key down at the bottom. And I'll draw your attention to a few key factors on this because this is kind of detailed and but I, I'd encourage you to look it over um, as you as you will, that it's available to you anytime in board docs and to members of our public and our community that are looking and listening on, that you can look at this and study. But the main points that I would have you see is that we are looking at a 1% overall decrease in our revenues from what we budgeted this year to what we budgeted, what we're budgeting next year. Largely that is due to the um, decrease or, or, or relatively level enrollment, but mostly it is um, the regionalization factor that we've discussed in previous board meetings that is stepping down from 17% to 16%. So there is a correlation there. Um, we are still developing the budget. And so these are key pieces that I was able to put together for you to bring forth so that you could at least have a, a vision of this. 
because these will be in the draft that is brought to you in July. The F-195F and the F-195, which is the OSPI's official uh, software that we need and that we utilize to prepare the budget is not actually even available yet. So they are still doing the programming on that. So I, I don't have that for you yet. I'm still working on the four-year forecast as well. That will be next for the, the revenue side and, and I'm working on that for you. The expenditures, um, in human resources is set up, employee salary and benefits contract data for the coming year in the budget module. And we're estimating salary increases between two and two and a half percent depending on the employee group. And um, that is a quick and high level summary of where uh, we've moved forward with our budget development since last we spoke and since we've been talking about this at each board meeting as things move along and develop. Um, and the timeline, I think I've probably said it multiple times. So I, <laughs> I will be bringing you the draft July 12, and then we'll bring it again in August for proposal for consideration of adoption and a public hearing. So that's what we're working on. And that's all I have for you, but I'm happy to take questions if you'd like. Great, because I have lots of questions. No, awesome. Actually, I just have a couple, Gina. Um, so uh, first and foremost, um, uh, when we talked about the enrollment um, projection uh, slide, um, if you go back to the, the previous slide, basically um, we're predicting for next school year still 600 less kids. Is that what that subtotal says? Or 400 less kids than the we had last than we had previously? Five. Because yes. we were 5,600. 5, so 5,650 right. was what was budgeted for last year. And this is close, more closely aligned to what we actually had. With a, uh, and then, so if, if it turns out, I guess my question is, is that if it turns out that come September, um, we have more enrollment and we've underestimated our budget here, that means we've also dramatically underestimated our revenue because we will get more revenue if students come back. Yes. When, my question is, when in the budget process, would we actually see the new revised revenue forecast to actually decide if we truly are planning a 1% shortage of revenue or actually the new enrollment that appears in September would actually have a, a larger, in, have an increase in revenue? Um, my gut is that it's like next February before it actually all trues up and we actually see the real numbers coming in and, and the real revenue and all of, all of that. But in the meantime, we're kind of stuck with this lower number, even though in September we could be at 5,600, we just don't know yet. But we won't see it in the numbers until, until the following February. Yes and no, because... Um... We'll be reporting out to you each month in our um, budget and enrollment reports. It doesn't necessarily give a four-year forecast in that format, but you would be seeing, okay, where's our enrollment coming in? And we would be needing to hire teachers and you would be approving those in the personnel reports to accommodate. We'd be um, looking at class loads and who, how many kiddos are in each class and where the demands are that we need to get a, a, a new teacher in pronto to take over a classroom. So those would be happening and reportable as they're, as we go. Um, if I would tell you that too, that if we got our enrollment came in and September, October, we were grossly under um, in, in what I mean, we have way more kids. I can report that ahead of time and turn around to OSPI and say, I need to revise our what you're basing our enrollment funding on now. And they will do that for us. Um, if we report it to them before October or middle of October, I'm able to adjust that. So that's used okay. for examples where we have big, big amount over and we don't wanna wait till January to 
have that reflected in what that's actually going to be in our apportionment dollars. So we, we can revise okay. that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That that that's that was my that was my only question. Okay. I hope I was able to answer it sort of. <laughs> you did, as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As always, thank you. Next meeting. All right. We'll see you again next meeting. We'll move on then to um, the annual annual review of risk management program. And that goes to Brian Lewis. Thank you, President Fay. Okay, so we're going to um, talk about our liability insurance program. Uh, who, who, who do we uh, buy our, our policy from, the coverages, uh, the benefits, and the costs associated with it? So, uh, our, policy, our board policy uh, 6500 and 6530 are controlling here in regards to a requirement to have a, a risk management program uh, and an annual review of our liability coverage. The, the, the this uh, presentations focuses on our on liability coverage. 6530 says uh, we'll maintain sufficient liability coverage to protect ourselves against claims for negligent or wrongful acts of staff or agent. Our, our provider is the Washington uh, Washington Schools Risk Management Pool, uh, and this is a consortium of school districts across the state of Washington of many different sizes, uh, and we all combine our resources together uh, to purchase liability insurance to cover all of us. And you'll see uh, why that's important in, the, uh, in a discussion later on in the slide. So uh, I'm gonna go over the liability coverages. We also purchase property coverage uh, from the risk pool, but this discussion is gonna focus solely on the liability component. Uh, but, Liability coverages, uh, we'll start with uh, general and automobile. There's also a, a vehicle co um, coverage later on. Uh, this is uh, valued at $10 million per occurrence. Uh, and the pool will pay, uh, uh, will provide that coverage for us uh, when we are obligated uh, to damages because of bodily injury, property damage, or other personal injury. Uh, there's also, the, the an automobile liability coverage that applies to our operation of buses and automobiles. Uh, next is errors and omissions. Uh, this uh, coverage applies to uh, damages uh, that result to us for, as a wrongful act of our employee. Uh, this also has a specific application to members of the board, and you're going to hear me say this a couple of times when you are acting in your official capacity. If you're acting as an individual and not within your capacity as a board member, there's an omissions coverage does not apply to regards to this consideration. So employment practices, again, $10 million per occurrence coverage. This would accrue to us as a result of sexual harassment, uh, or damages that are that are found were found owing as a result of sexual harassment, discrimination, wrongful employment, termination, invasion of privacy, libel, slander, or defamation of character. And again, this coverage also applies to members of the board of directors when they are acting in their official capacity. This is in addition to uh, the employees of the school district. Uh, excess liability. Uh, this applies to all the different forms of liability that I just reviewed. Uh, this is a stopgap kind of uh, coverage uh, and that it, if the, any of the other liability uh, uh, fields do not have adequate coverage up to $10 million, then this coverage is, uh, is up to $30 million uh, with an aggregate of $70 million so that uh, the risk pool will not pay out more than $70 million under this aggregate or this excess coverage. I'm going to show you a slide in a minute uh, detailing uh, our rates, uh, but I wanted you to know in advance that uh, our rates are going to increase next year. 
uh, and these are the reasons why we should expect to see a rate increase. Uh, changes in the law uh, allowing adult non-dependent plaintiffs to join lawsuits, uh, increasing the cost of fatality claims. Uh, in the past, it had only been restricted to uh, dependents uh, and uh, the, the minor children of depend or minor dependents of the plaintiff. Uh, the, uh, the, there was a movement within this uh, state legislature this year to shield schools uh, from liability claims uh, due to coronavirus exposure, uh, and that was not approved by the legislature. Uh, you see the reference here to safe harbor. Uh, other states, uh, legislatures did provide a safe harbor for school districts and private businesses. Uh, our legislature chose not to do so. Uh, this causes the risk pool to assess its potential um, exposure to future claims and increase uh, our coverage uh, requirements in those areas, uh, resulting in rate increases. Uh, there's also been uh, some issues regarding sexual abuse and molestation, not with the Arlington Public Schools, uh, but with other school districts across the state who are members of the pool. Uh, and the state legislature also made some decisions this year about uh, capping claims and uh, and, who, and now we're seeing uh, claims from uh, multiple years ago being presented. Uh, and when those claims, uh, when, when the incident occurred that generated those claims, uh, they were based on uh, coverages that were provided uh, 20 years ago. Uh, those coverages are, are higher now. Uh, so uh, monies were not collected uh, to provide funding to settle those claims uh, at, the, at the value that they were established back uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so the risk pool is having to collect uh, additional uh, funds from school districts to cover the present value of those claims. So again, I want to um, in reinforce with you that we're not experiencing any of these conditions right now, but because of our membership in the pool, uh, Whatever fortunes the, the pool experiences, uh, we also experience in the same way. Uh, we are definitely uh, activists in terms of uh, investigating issues and preventing uh, sexual abuse and molestation from occurring within our school districts or within our school buildings. Uh, but other districts uh, have not had uh, the same kind of luck or, or foresight as we have had, uh, and these things are occurring there. So, all that being said, uh, we should expect to see a, a rate increase in 2021-22 that uh, is pretty significant. Um, want to point out to you that it's not all due to liability; uh, it's partially due to property. I spoke about that earlier. That uh, this discussion is focusing exclusively on the liability component, uh, but there is an increase associated with property. Uh, coverage, uh, but the, the vast majority of the increase that we're going to see next year is due to liability. Uh, a, another change that the pool is putting into effect in 21-22 is they're removing deductibles. Uh, in the past, uh, we'd always chosen, uh, we had two options. One was to choose a, a zero deductible or a $5,000 deductible, and it's kind of taking a risk. Uh, by choosing uh, the $5,000 deductible over the zero deductible, and that you're, you're betting that claims that you would have uh, would, that would generate a deductible cost would be less than the cost difference between the zero deductible and the $5,000. And that's worked out for us in the past in the, the cost differential. We've, we've always selected the $5,000 deductible and not found ourselves in a position where we the deductible costs were greater than the than the savings that we received from choosing that level of deductible. That choice is being removed from us this year. We don't have an opportunity to choose uh, that five thousand dollar deductible. On the other side of that, you know, is that we've got full coverage for all of our claims. So no more deductible costs associated with that. So there's good and bad uh, with be happy to answer any questions you might have. 
Brian, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed there's kind of an upward trend for the last three years. Is that the industry trending upward? Is that what we can expect over the next few years in addition to this upward increase? I believe so. Uh, what we're finding is that there's uh, fewer and fewer uh, reinsurers. A reinsurer is like a wholesaler of insurance services or insurance live uh, coverage. Uh, and the marketplace is shrinking. There's fewer and fewer uh, willing to provide that kind of wholesale insurance to retailers like the risk pool that we belong to. Uh, and that, that decrease in competition is driving up costs in addition to the other reasons that I showed earlier. Uh, so I do think that you know, we, we should be prepared to see no matter who would be providing us insurance uh, an increase in costs over time. Thank you, Brian. Hey, hey Brian, it's Mike Ray. Uh, I, I apologize if I missed it. I had to step out for just a second. Um, did you did you mention um, research in other avenues? I know you were just asking answering Mary's question, but um, I know there's not very very many providers or uh, get an idea. I'm assuming everybody's in the same boat about. Yeah, not a, not a, I have not done that at this point. Uh, we just received word of this increase uh, just the week before we submitted board documents. Uh, it's something that that we can look at. I know that there's um, our, our neighbor district uses an insurance provider called Propel. Uh, I was uh, at a prior district. Uh, we were members of a, a pool called the Canfield Pool, uh, and there may be a few others out there that are willing to work with us directly. Uh, my experience has been uh, that the, and I've I've worked in a, with districts with a couple of different pools. Uh, that the risk pool is uh, very activist in nature, and that they provide services to us to help us uh, anticipate uh, conditions that would create a claim uh, or to mitigate uh, uh, our our the pool's losses, so to speak, when a claim is presented uh, and, and if it becomes uh, uh, approved by the court. Uh, so I, I guess bottom line is what I'm trying to say is that I don't know that we're gonna find a better value uh, considering the range of services the risk pool provides to us uh, and the out-of-pocket costs. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't look at it, uh, but, but I'm not gonna be surprised if we don't find uh, a better, a better, uh, better deal out. Great, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, I know the risk pool provides a lot of uh, benefits, kind of behind the scenes, like like you like you talked about, which are great for us to help mitigate that that overall expense. And there's just you know the cost of doing business and the costs are going up. Um, so, yeah, uh, obviously, just felt needed to answer the question. Are we tied in with them um, for a significant period of time or not? It's a three-year withdrawal process. Uh, we have to make, uh, if we choose to, to leave the pool, uh, we have to provide notification and we don't actually get to exit for three years. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. And uh, when's the, I'm sure you reviewed it when you started, I'm guessing. Sorry, what? You reviewed um, our uh, using the risk pool with other options when you, uh, started your position in the last couple of years. So it's been, since you're here that it's been um, looked at? No, I have not. Oh, not okay. a comparison, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. A lot of things on your plate right now, but sounds good, appreciate it. Sure. If there are no other questions, thank you, Brian, as always. Um, thank you. Absolutely, thank you for your time and thank you for your research on this. With that, we'll move on to item I, resolution 21-08, authorization to invest funds. And this goes to Dr. Sweeting. Yes, this is an annual um, responsibility or annual resolution that uh, the board considers and approves because it gives the authority for myself uh, and Gina Zunhorst as our finance um, person to invest our money because we don't spend all of that in one, one 
place at one time and we just want to make sure that it's being the money that we received is being used wisely and being invested wisely so it's an annual authorization to invest funds and it requires board um, approval through resolution i'll move that we approve resolution 2108 authorization to invest funds second Thank you. It's been moved and seconded um, for um, to approve resolution 2108 authorization to invest funds. Um, Madam Secretary, could you call for a vote, please? Director Kelly. Aye. Director Levesque. Aye. Director Ray. Aye. Director Rawson. Director Rawson. Aye. President Hi, Aye. thank you, Gina. And we'll move on to item J, second reading and adoption of policies 6600 and 6605. And this again goes back to Brian Lewis. Thank you, President Fay. Uh, policy 6600 is relative to the district's obligation to uh, provide transportation for students who may have an infant uh, and to provide of that transportation either on board uh, one of our school buses or to find an alternative method uh, to provide that transportation. There's also uh, some discussion uh, regarding our uh, notification to the community regarding emergency snow routes. Uh, at the last reading, there were no uh, requests for changes to this, uh, uh, this proposed policy. Uh, and and I, I think I'd move on to the next question, Julie, or the next policy, Julie. So questions, if there's any questions, they, they come at the end. Uh, the next policy 6605 is relative to uh, basically safe routes to school, uh, student safety, walking, biking, biking and riding buses. Uh, there was a, the addition to uh, the policy uh, is a, a factors that we would consider when structuring a safe route to school. Uh, and that uh, all schools have a, uh, a, a walking or biking route plan in place and, and the factors that they would consider uh, creating that plan. And this is elementary schools specifically that are being referenced in this policy. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, then if there are no questions, um, Julie, can we make a motion on both of these at the same time? Yes, they are okay. one action item. I'd like a motion to approve both of these policies, 6600 and 6605. I move that we uh, adopt policy 6600 and 6605. I second. Thank you, it's been moved and seconded to adopt um, policy 6600 and 6605. Madam Secretary, could we ask for a vote? Director Kelly? Aye. Director Levesque? Aye. Director Ray? Aye. Director Rawson? Aye. President Fay? Aye. With that, we'll move on to our last agenda item under new business, which is item K, first reading of board policies 3112, 3200, 3241, and 4300. And that goes to Will Nelson. Thank you, President Fay. Uh, I'm Will Nelson, Director of Equity and Student Success. And uh, I'm bringing you policy 3112, uh, which is a new policy on social emotional climate. And it is requesting um, a process similar to a school improvement process for the social and emotional uh, climate, um, uh, which is aligned with the social and emotional learning standards that have been developed at the state level. Any questions on that one? Or uh, how do you want to run this, Judy? Um, yes, let's, um, thank you, Ms., uh, Mr. Nelson. Um, let's, let's stop after each one if there's any input or questions and I'm just gonna go ahead and begin and because I'm online. And could we add after in the first paragraph under the goal, after equitable, could we do a second um, uh, addition to that and add inclusive? And then at the end of the policy, 
where it says um, it ends with board's goal for this policy. I'd like to add each year schools climate improvement process and results will be reported in each school's improvement plan. Those are my only two suggestions for policy 3112. Are there any other um, questions or thoughts on from the board members on this policy? No, then um, Mr. Nelson, um, do you want me to repeat that? Uh, I think I got it, but yes. Could you repeat it one more time, Judy? Absolutely. I'd like to, um, after equitable under the goal, um, at the very end of the sentence, I'd like to add inclusive after equitable. And I'd like to add at the end of the policy each year, Schools climate improvement process and results will be reported in each school's improvement plan. Okay, I got, I think I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and uh, are there any other questions before I move on to the 3200 policy? Okay, so uh, policy 3200 is a deletion and part of this is embedded in the new discipline policy, which I will uh, talk about in a minute. So uh, I'm assuming there isn't any discussion since it's a deletion. <laughs> so I'll move on to the next uh, the next policy, which is 3241, and it's student discipline. And there's a lot that has been changed in this policy, and it is all advocating for um, students' rights and due process, and constantly looking for ways to. Um, use discipline as a form of learning and to keep kids in school by not excluding them. That's really what the, the trend is in this uh, policy. Um, Will, could we go to page four? Um, and what am I looking for? I'm look, looking for the section where we had bullets there. Let's see. Um, no, are we on page four? That's, that's what here, I see. Here we go. Yep, here mm -hmm. we are. So this this policy adds, um, as, as I was reading it, it adds a lot of, of action items. Um, and this example on page four is, is examples for me of action items. The district will support each school to set at least one goal annually. So I'd like to, and we have four, what I'm gonna call action items. Um, I'd like to add one to that. Um, I'd like to add, provide professional development to learn and allocate PLC time to implement restorative justice circles slash class meetings slash problem solving circles. Um, and this, this um, statement that I'd like to add to this policy has been requested um, also in the equity plan proposal um, to include um, restorative justice um, to, to help teachers um, through professional development and through PLCs to learn how to implement those in our classrooms. And certainly we don't do restorative justice circles in grade schools in a kindergarten classroom, but we do indeed do um, class meetings or problem solving circles. So I would suggest we add that. And then also um, at the end of the bullets where it says schools will share 
identify goals and action plans with all staff students. I would like to include um, that we would add schools will share identified goals, comma, action plans and results with all students, parents, families and community and then add at the end of that take off the period and add with a report included in each school's yearly improvement plan. That way we'll be able to hear the progress that's being made um, in policy 3241. Okay, any other thoughts? So I'm not hearing any other thoughts. Uh, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, policy, policy 4300, which is limiting immigration enforcement in schools. And uh, this policy is meant to provide a safe environment for all students, including students who um, uh, may be subject to immigration law. Will, the only thing I had a tough time on this one was the first word. I tell you, I stumbled on that one, applicably. So I, the only suggestion I would have is a word that, um, you know, would a little bit be easier to pronounce and understand and maybe um, relevance. But I'm just throwing that out there that applicably was a tough one for me. I agree. Judy, when you're done, I got a few comments. I'm, I'm done. Cool. Hey, Will, I, I was just hoping maybe you could give some, a little bit more maybe background or explanation on, on how some of this reads to me like, um, fourth bullet point in there, um, you know, federal immigration authorities, including um, surveillance constitute enforcement. I mean, that kind of sounds like, yeah, uh, I don't want to say, uh, the only thing I can come up with is what else would it be? Um, so maybe, and you used some words here at the beginning, um, and I'm not coming up with what they were, but um, challenges with uh, immigration law. So can you give me some examples of what types of students that might be affecting? Because I'm, I'm maybe not clear. Well, it would be any student that is, their family is immigrating from another country into the United States. Um, so illegally or illegally immigrating, would that be? I, I think it's just immigrating in general. Yes. Gotcha. So, okay. And so because of this, we um, generally like summar summarizing up this, it seems like, of course, we're not going to stand in the way of any law enforcement activities, but we're certainly not going to um, necessarily offer up support. Would that be a good way to summarize that unless legally obligated to do so? Um. So the second bullet, I think, Mike, uh, addresses your question, I think. Arlington Public Schools policies prohibiting participation or aid in immigration enforcement will apply for enforcement activity against students, their families, staff, and volunteers. So we would do everything to limit access of uh, immigration enforcement in schools. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I will make a comment on this one, if you, is that um, the, um, 
there, there may be in the future some revisions to this that may be presented to us from WASDA. So some of the uh, you know, parameters and legal guidance may change in the future because some of the supporting documentation that was provided in the board packet, it talks about there's, there's uh, potential for some revisions coming forth. And, and I don't know how soon that would be, but just FYI. Certainly. Appreciate that. Yeah, I have some I have some pretty big concerns about this policy overall. Um, just as a general comment to the to the board and um, yeah. In fact, if you if you don't mind, uh, Doctor Sweeting and, and President Faye, sorry to interrupt. If that's okay, um, when this comes to um, uh, an adoption, can we make sure that uh, policy 4300 is standalone on an uh, action item on the agenda? Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Thank you. So, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so with that, I don't think there are any other questions. And that was just a first reading. Um, so we will bring that back for a second reading in July. Um, I think that I'd just like to say that um, I would encourage um, anyone that's objecting um, to a policy or to a motion or um, or in support of a policy or a motion to explain um, their position so that we all can understand their position. Um, and that just gives us all more information. So I would encourage that to happen always. Um, with that, that's the end of our new business. And um, Will, I'm just going to say this fast because I don't know if I'm going to see you again unless I come to LaConnor. So I just want, I don't know if, you, if, if June is your, your ending date or, or if it's July. So I want to say a huge thank you um, in appreciation for all that you've done for Arlington School District. And um, yeah, thank you, Mike. A round of applause because um, we've done things um, brand new that haven't been done before in Arlington. And it's through your leadership that that's happened. And um, thank you. Um, oh, I don't. You put an echo. Thanks, Will. Good luck to you in your new position over there. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight, I do not have to say goodbye to Julie because she's not leaving until the end of August. Um, so that I don't have to do. And then we can move on to, unless anyone else wants to say goodbye to Will. Mwah. Uh, we'll move on to informational items and we'll begin with the superintendent's report. So I have two items. First of all, today our summer school, the first of our summer school programs started our EL camps at every elementary school. So it's exciting. Next week, the other programs uh, at the high school and the middle school and elementary because literacy camp will start as well um, all next week. And then I just wanna say how proud I am um, and how awesome it was to be at graduations. And I'm just so proud of the 438 Arlington High School graduates and the 34 Weston High School graduates. And a special congratulations to both Mike and Mark who had very special graduates of their very own. And due to being able to be in person, they could, they could be there. And that was awesome. And I just, I, I think that's, Amazing. So that's all I have to say for tonight. And thank you, Dr. Squeeding. And then from there, we'll move on. I'm getting spacey here. Um, we'll move on to the legislative update and discussion with Mark. So um, I don't really have anything to report um, other than, uh, you know, this is a time to kind of, uh, you know, uh, sharpen our positions, um, get ready for the ledge comp, the conference coming up. Um, so if you haven't reviewed your positions, also, uh, as you know, I'm leaving the board uh, uh, in November. And so you guys will be looking for another legislative uh, wrap. 
I'm more than happy to um, pay it forward, do education, work with someone, whoever is going to be the, legis the new legislative rep as far as making the connections, making sure they know who the 39th legislative district members are, um, who are the leaders at the other seven districts in the 39th that we network with. So there's kind of a whole legislative turnover. Um, I, I think I've done a pretty good job at trying to make sure that our legislative rep position is um, effective. And I don't want to see it uh, go backward. I want to see it actually take what I've done and actually move it forward. So whatever I can do to help transition, um, even post-November um, uh, to the new legislative rep, uh, just make sure uh, you know I'm down for it. Mark, you've done it phenomenal job um and the, as a legislative rep it is is really truly uh, i mean really unbelievable thank you for all you've done i know you got a bunch of time left so i'm not you got time but yeah you, you got big shoes to fill there buddy big shoes to fill well, I, like i said I, I i will make sure i i try to help whoever the next person is uh get on board quickly Thank you, Mr. Rawson. And any other board member that would like to add a comment tonight? You know, I know we're at three hours. So just again, congrats to uh, Kate um, uh, and uh, Rawson there and, and all the students that graduated. Um, it's just, it was a pleasure to be involved. Uh, the weather held out. Um, it was just fantastic. And uh, I know that it'll probably be, uh, fingers crossed, last time at the uh, Larson Stadium for quite some time. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty pretty great experience. Thanks everybody for all of the hard work, Mr. Fish team and, and Dr. Sweeting and her team, really everybody. Yes, awesome effort by, uh, by everyone. Um, really appreciated uh, making uh, uh, Mike's experience and my experience special. Um, for that day. Thank you both. Mary, would you like to add anything? Nope, I'm looking forward to summer. Good, me too. And Sherry, would you like to add anything? Nope, just bring on the sunshine. All right, thank you. Um, and I'll just end the meeting with um, a thank you to um, um, Principal Fish um, and Principal um, Andrea for making both of the graduations outstanding. I just am amazed at how well you pulled this together. Um, and it was, it was beautifully done. I honestly would suggest let's do it outside in the stadium every year. It was beautifully done. It was a beautiful day. And I understand Mr. Fish, I was sitting behind you that you said it, you had especially ordered the weather. So thank you for doing that. Um, beautifully done. The students um, were so commanding. Um, I got home and my daughter said, did anybody act up or do a dance or do a jig or anything and or something? And I said, no, this was an amazing um, ceremony that was heartfelt and very respectfully and thoughtfully done. So uh, my hat's off, not to, just to Principal Fish, but all of his staff that pulled this off and the students that remarkably pulled this off. Thank you. And then with that, I'm going to ask, oh gosh, I have no cal calendar in front of me. So we will have a next meeting on July 12th. 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 Oh, thank you. And we will be back here um, tackling tough topics again. And um, I'm going to ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. I move that we adjourn the meeting. So awesome. again. <laughs> it has been motioned and seconded to adjourn the meeting. Could I have um, Madam Secretaries? Director Kelly? Kelly? Aye. Director Levesque? Aye. Director Ray? I was I was going to discuss it a little bit, but no, I. <laughs> Director Rawson. Aye. President Faye. Aye. Good night.